before we get into the actual story arc, there are a couple of things we need to discuss that I have failed to mention previously. That begins with these two, Rough and Tumble. They are your classic two-man tag team of bully bad boys, a proud tradition made famous by Bebop and Rocksteady of TMNT fame, and then glammed up by Jesse and James of Pokemon fame. And this pairing's even been used a couple times in extended Sonic media. But unlike a lot of those other pairings, these guys actually look like Sonic characters, certainly more than the first time they used a skunk in a Sonic comic. I don't really plan on doing a full episode on these two characters, because you've probably seen this set up plenty of times before. A couple of brutes who can give the heroes the business but never actually win. They're just here to carry out orders and fill time with fights that usually end in a comedic defeat. And I have a really hard time differentiating their personalities. I know the big one has a missing tail and he's real sensitive about it, but they are basically the same person between two different bodies. Not much below the surface, but they are still fun every time they show up. Considering how new the IDW universe is, we haven't had a chance to have too many encounters with them, but we already know the deal. They're jerks, and they love weapons. First time they used Wispins, and then they got their tailless Tuckus Whoop by Sonic and Knuckles, and then they showed back up with some new weapons. And, again, they got defeated. They are a threat to normal civilians, but obviously don't stand much of a chance against Sonic and his crew. And they wouldn't even have had a second chance to tackle Sonic and his friends had they not been busted out of jail first. And that's thanks to the third new villain we're going to be discussing, Dr. Starline a brilliant yet self-absorbed scientist and a die-hard Eggman fanboy. Think of Snively just, you know, not sniveling, and with actual smarts to back up all that ambition. Now, I know this dude looks like he should be griefing Scrooge McDuck and his nephews, but nope, this is a Sonic character. And he's not a duck, he's a platypus. A dastardly, duck-billed, pretentious platypus. And what a fantastic fit for this franchise. How have they not used one of these before? They have hedgehogs and echidnas. Oh, and speaking of, did you know that these things are the only other mammal, besides echidnas, that lay eggs and they're poisonous? I completely forgot about that before Gilly the Kid randomly reminded me while we were talking about these odd little animals. Oh, and shout out to Gilly, of course. If you've not checked out his channel, go do that, you big dum-dum. Don't you like good things? Look at his neck. Look how beautiful that neck is. Go watch his stuff. Dumb, dumb. They lay eggs, they got a duck bill, a beaver tail, spurred feet, and they're poisonous. How are jackalopes not a real thing, but this is? How is a Psyduck, the closest Pokemon comparison I can make, less weird than the actual animal? Also, how do Sonic and Pokemon not have jackalope characters yet? Come on, guys. Well, Starline doesn't have a beaver tail, but he does have web gloves and spurs on his heeled boots. I love those little details. Oh, and he also has a warped topaz. That's right, kid. Kids, we have yet another magical MacGuffin made from precious stone in the Sonic universe. And it does what the name implies, warps you from one place to the other. It's basically a portal gun, which, yes, is uh, is basically chaos control. Essentially making this like another stupid gem, somewhat redundant. I'll share more of my general opinion on the reliance of Pretty Rocks at the end of this arc's coverage, but for now, pay attention because this gem is important. And thankfully, unlike the Phantom Root, Ruby, the capabilities of the Warp Topaz are clearly laid out. Starline has spent his life studying this specific gem, so he has a really good handle on how to use it, and use it he does. He can hop from one place to another in an instant, or open a portal to use as a window to peer into other parts of the world, if he were, say, in search of something or someone, and needed to scour a large amount of land in a short amount of time. And he can use this as a means to transport equipment or allies with ease, or leave items in specific places without ever being detected. All of that without having to hold it above his head and yell chaos control. So yes, it is a very useful gem, but unlike the emeralds, it is not a source of its own energy. It needs outside assistance to make any of this possible. Thankfully for Starline, as he discovered, it really doesn't take much to get this thing going. As he puts it, even the most passive of energy waves will get it to do all of those wonderful things I just listed. I think that would make this the most battery efficient thing ever created by Sega. Too bad it's fictional, because seriously, Sega, how do you have a device made in 2020 that runs on two AA batteries and still only lasts for a couple of hours? I know the Game Gear Micro is a throwback, but you do understand, like, this was the one thing nobody wanted to come back, right? How is this thing $50? Four ROMs? Why do... 
Why do I still want it? What's wrong with me? Anyway, while the warp topaz is energy efficient, that energy needs to remain on the low side, and it needs to remain controlled. With years of research and practice, as well as a custom-made glove, the platypus is now the only person on the planet who can confidently use the topaz in an efficient and masterful way. He even gives Sonic and Silver a hard time when he faces off against them in a later issue. These three new villains were created to fill a specific role that had not yet been filled in this new canon, and honestly, I think they fit quite well, be it more simple like the skunks or more complex like the platypus. I quickly grew to like all of these characters. They fit in well with Sonic's world, and even better with his nemesis, Eggman. Or as we last knew him when we last were with him, Mr. Tinker. As I pointed out in the video covering the battle for Angel Island, he had actually been kidnapped in a quick page between all the action with Neo Metal Sonic. Well, that's all thanks to Starline and his pretty swirly marble. The Knot Duck used his topaz to open windows all across the world to track down Eggman after he was defeated in the war. He managed to do what Eggman's roaming badniks had failed to do for months. He found Eggman, and then portaled out Rough and Tumble from jail in exchange for capturing Tinker to bring him to Starline, where he would begin the process of returning Eggman to his old self. But despite his best efforts, he doesn't seem to be getting anywhere. I mean, it does look like Tinker is taking more of an interest to Eggman's old badniks, but considering that he coddles them, this is clearly still Tinker through and through. Also, I just wanted to quickly point out how much I love the quick interaction between Tinker and Warbot and Cubot. They just don't know how to handle a kind robotnik. <laughs> he even asked if they'd feel better if he yelled at them, or maybe gave him a list of eldritch monsters that he can resurrect and lose control over. It's stuff like this that makes me stress that you really need to read the comics. It's full of great little moments like this that a summary can't properly cover. I also love the layout of the lab clearly reminiscent of the interior of Sonic Adventure's egg carrier. Also, that reminds me, later on in the issue, we see Rouge chilling on a sunbathing chair and comments on Eggman's surprising workout routine. Like, that has to be a nod to those goofy pool chairs in the egg carrier, right? I know it's not the exact same design, but I remember thinking it was hilarious that Robotnik had an indoor pool and a ton of sunbathing chairs surrounding it in the game. Ah, man, whatever, that's, that's great. But back to the lab. The reason why we had to focus on the door in the first place is because somebody was coming through it, and that somebody, or something, was Metal Sonic. But now that we're all caught up with Starline and Tinker, we do need to rewind a little bit. As you might recall, Metal Sonic had returned to normal after his defeat on Angel Island, but Sonic wasn't just going to let that robot run free. No, first he was going to have Tails reactivate him, make him functional again, but of course make his weapons useless, and then set him free. I had a couple of problems with this after I read this scene. I mean, it just seemed like the stupidest move to make. But it is consistent with Sonic's characterization in this comic, and it would be addressed. Somewhat. Uh, we'll get to that in due time. That and this series itself has set the precedence of some sort of robotic sentience in Eggman's machines. Both Orbot and Cubot in this very issue are mentioned to have emotions programmed into them. Gemeral and Omega are both their own beings. And when Metal had a voice, he too seemed to be his own person. So I understand why why Sonic would treat him as a person, and have the compassion to offer him another path outside of Eggman's service, since to him, that's no longer an option. But Metal, unsurprisingly, tells Sonic where he can stick his friendship, in the silent miming way he knows how to do, and then jets off. Tails, who has rightfully been questioning Sonic's choices, yet been going along with him just fine, asks Sonic if it was a good idea to let this consistently dangerous robot off on his own. And Sonic's like, yeah, no, it's fine. And then two pages later, Metal shows up at the hidden lab where Tinker is being held. All right, another thing before I go forward, this was another glaring issue I had. So Neo Metal's whole deal was taking Eggman's place while he was simultaneously searching for the real deal once he went missing after the war. He had Badniks and the Egg Fleet at his disposal, but couldn't find him all this time. But now that he's a mute neutered robot with no resources, he finds the guy in seemingly seconds. Is it because the base is lighting off some sort of signal? Is it because Sonic also clued Metal into the fact that Eggman was alive and well? Am I just missing a throwaway line here? I mean, it's not the biggest deal in the world, but come on. But whatever the case is, Metal's appearance is the final push needed to bring back Dr. Ivo Eggman Robotnik. And we can argue over what we call this guy all we want, but one name that absolutely no longer fits is Mr. Tinker.
I was genuinely surprised how much I enjoyed the Tinker persona, and how bummed I was to see it leave, as inevitable as it was. I had a good time with his scenes, and ironically, Sonic seemed to get along best with Eggman when he was dressed like a long-lost Mario brother. Now, oh, well, it was fun while it lasted. Toot toot, Tinker. As sad as it was to say goodbye to the sunnier side of Eggman, the comic wastes no time in re-establishing how great of a character the real deal actually is. I can just hear Mike Pollock in his lines. It's fantastic. Eggman wastes no time assessing the scene before him and letting everybody in the room, old and new, know that he was in charge, sending Orb and Cube to get him some more fitting clothes and metal onto a table so he can begin repairs. Also, I love the relationship between these two in the comic. It's the best it's ever been. And I also love how quickly he becomes the shredder to rough and tumbles Bebop and Rocksteady. And Starline, despite having gone through all of this trouble just to bring back the good doctor, doesn't get so much as a thank you, but Starline's not done proving his worth. He not only tracked down and brought back Eggman and his own assistants, both with his intelligence and the warped topaz, and two lumbering lackeys who already hate Sonic, he also brought along all seven Chaos Emeralds. Oh boy. A short while after Eggman gets himself caught up on all of Metal Sonic's data he had collected as Neo, Starline points out how close Metal got to winning, and with a few tweaks, they could potentially take out Sonic once and for all. But Eggie dismisses this. Plan's over and done with. It's time to move on to something else. Starline is excited at the prospect and amazed how quickly Eggman has a new scheme ready to go, but also keep the scene in mind going forward. The choices made by both Sonic and Eggman are going to be further explored as this story carries on. Now that he has his lackeys, it's time to put them to work. Eggman sends them off on their missions while bringing out the plans for his big comeback declaring the world had made him suffer a major defeat, and in turn, he would make the world suffer. And little did Sonic, the reader, or even Eggman himself know just how bad things were gonna get. Sonic is just chilling on a beach, recapping to a flicky what had been happening in the series up to this point. And since we have already done that in this show, we're not gonna bother doing that. But like most times Sonic is chilling on a beach, he's rudely interrupted by a new adventure. This time being in the form of a panicked Tails, who lets Sonic know that an invitation just randomly appeared in his workshop. An invitation to celebrate the return of the world's most brilliant doctor. And... It seems pretty obvious that Tinker has been returned to his Eggman persona. Sonic does hope that that's not as simple as it seems, but they won't really know for sure until they go to Windmill Village to check it out. So, the duo head off. Meanwhile, Eggman's chilling in his secret base while the platypus, Starline, enters the room. Turns out he's the one who uses Warp Topaz to drop off the note in Tails' workshop. He then asks Eggman, wh why? <laughs> why even do this? Sonic doesn't know that Eggman's back. He doesn't need to know Eggman's back. They can sneakily get away with whatever plan they're up to without his knowledge. Eggman replies that it's just kind of the way he does things. He wants to mess with Sonic's head. He wants to know that Eggman is back and working on something, but he doesn't want Sonic to know exactly what he's working on. Starline goes along with it. He is an Eggman fanboy after all, but this won't be the last time he questions the way the Doctor runs things. But what is the Great Doctor up to anyway? Well, we find out as he pours a metallic ooze over a flower, instantly transforming it into metal. This is the first of the few experiments we're going to be seeing for the metal virus. We jump back to Sonic, who has arrived at Windmill Village, and finds the Elder... Scruffy, that's his name, and tied up to a tree branch and just put the pinata sign on him. My god, that's so brutal. Scruffy informs Sonic that Tinker had been kidnapped about a week ago and nobody could find Sonic to inform him. But before they can deal with that, they have to deal with Rough and Tumble. They're the ones that have assaulted the Elder and Windmill Village as a whole, and it looks like they have brand new toys they didn't have before. Sonic takes note of this, saying that they're not smart enough to come up with this tech on their own, so they obviously know where Eggman currently is. We're not going to spend too much time on the fight, so if you want to see how that plays out, I recommend checking it out, because the art is quite fantastic and frenetic. We're instead going to go back to focus on Eggman and his experiments. He's moved on from vegetation to fauna, pouring the virus over a little rabbit. Or, I, P Pocky, I guess, in this world. I keep forgetting all these little guys have stupid names. These experiments are letting the reader know how the metal virus is going to work. If you're dumped in the stuff, you instantly transform into a zombie robot. But if you're just touched by a zombie robot, it will spread the infection, but not instantaneously. 
This page lets us know that these robots do obey the word of Eggman. But he also notes that the subject shows aggressive tendencies without direction. He just sees this as a bonus, but again, this is foreshadowing of things to come. The experiments continue, with our little squirrel friend now taking up the metal flower and touching it to different objects to see if the virus will spread to anything else. As it turns out, it only works on organics, but things that are processed or inorganic material remains unaffected. Meanwhile, Sonic and Tails wrap things up with the two skunks, and I gotta say, I do love how these look like fun boss battles, like I would love to take these guys on in a video game. Showing off Tails calculations by ricocheting a tub of what I guess is skunk smell. Also, I don't know how I've never realized that through all these years of Sonic comics, I've never once expected any of the skunks to actually stink up a place. Like, this is the very first time I've even thought about it, and it's kind of genius it's used in this way. Anyway, yeah, they stink up one of the skunks, and then they chop off the robotic tail of the other, which just sends him into a deep depression. He's just done. He doesn't even feel like fighting anymore. Poor guy. But before they can round these guys up and send them back to jail, a portal just opens up under them and freaks out Sonic and Tails. The skunks are gone. And while Sonic can confirm that Tinker is no longer in Windmill Village and Eggman is probably back, he really hasn't gotten much further in uncovering this mystery. That's fine because he's going to now turn to Silver to see if he's made any headway in whatever he's doing. Apparently some random dude just told Silver where an Eggman base was, so the two hogs are gonna go follow up on it. And sure enough, they discover warp portals and some classic Eggman baddies moving tech into it. But before they can strike, Metal Sonic appears and sends Silver flying. As you might recall, just a couple of issues ago, Sonic decided to set this guy free, but looks like he's back at full power, so good job there, Sonic. Anyway, a fight ensues and Silver manages to get the drop on Metal, holding him in place with his telekinesis. But just like the skunks, Metal is teleported out with a warp portal, reappearing next to Dr. Star. Line. This being Sonic's first encounter with the platypus. He makes a grand show of it, excited to finally take on the hedgehog who has griefed the great doctor all these years, the one being who can truly match his mentor. He's excited to see how he fares against him. All the while, Eggman is continuing his experiments with the metal virus, this time showing that repeat exposure to the virus from an infected will speed up the process. That's all the info he needs, and he's ready to step into phase two, but before he does, Rough and Tumble pop back into the base, a little ticked off that their new weaponry didn't work in taking down Sonic and Tails, and they demand more weapons. And Eggman knows just what to give them. While all this is happening, Silver and Sonic continue to take on Starline and Metal, and those warp portals are giving them a lot of trouble. But no matter how far away Starline throws Sonic, he eventually makes his way back, pinning the platypus down and demanding some details on Eggman. Starline tells him that everything's been secured in the vault and gives Silver the access code. And Silver goes to check it out while Sonic has the platypus in his grasp. But the only thing Starline will give up is that Eggman is planning something breathtaking and that he also planted explosives inside the vault and he just gave his friend the detonation code. Sonic goes chasing in after Silver as the base explodes. Starline looks on, proud of what he's managed to accomplish and sure the doctor will appreciate the defeat of his greatest foe. But as he opens a portal back to the base, Eggman grabs Starline by the throat and throws him against the glass that is containing his metal virus experiments. Furious that Starline would attempt to take down Sonic on his his own. Starline doesn't understand though. Why wouldn't he want Sonic out of the way? He would just mess with his plans. Eggman retorts that the Hedgehog is his to destroy. He could carpet bomb him whenever he felt like, but that's not the point. But actually, he did try that in Sonic 3 and that didn't work out too well. Anyway, the point is Eggman wants to take him down with his brilliance. There's a certain way to vanquish a lifelong nemesis, as he puts it. Starline apologizes and Eggman tells him, don't let it happen again. Starline's a bit confused. We're like, I, I, I don't think it could happen again. Like, what are you talking about, man? But Eggman knows how the hedgehog works and shows a live feed of the destroyed base. Sonic is alive and well. Eggman then follows up by asking why he wanted the junk out of that base anyway. He hadn't used it in years, all that stuff's obsolete. But to Starline, they're treasured collectibles of Eggman's legacy, which I'm sure will be coming into play down the road for Starline. 
Eggman waves it off and just asks him how his first encounter with the rodent felt. Starline tells him that the experience had put a lot of things into perspective for him. And they, uh, certainly will as the story continues on. Back at Restoration HQ, Silver gets put to bed so he can recover from saving Sonic from the blast, and him and Amy decide it might be best to go check out another Eggman base, one he's no longer using, in an attempt to tap into his network to see what he's up to. So the two speed off onto their next adventure. Now, keep in mind, this is 14 issues in at this point, and we have a pretty good flow of things. Sonic usually teams up with one of his friends, they stop some small skirmish while building up to the bigger baddie. Last year, it was Neo Metal Sonic, but it all played out like pretty standard Sonic fare. But going into issue 15, while things still seem to be par for the course, things would take a drastic turn at the end of this issue. Sonic and Amy end up at Echo Mont. Tell it's an Eggman base by, uh, well, you know, he's, uh, he's got a face on the side of a mountain, so it's probably his. The two chat back and forth, giving us a lot of needed exposition about the Eggman War. A lot of stuff we never really got from Sonic Forces. Sonic notes that it seems like there was a big battle here, and Amy replies that there was, and they lost a lot of good people in it, too. They continue to talk for a bit, and Sonic reassuring her that they eventually won the war, and Amy made sure sure those sacrifices mattered, that they meant something. Amy replies, well, you, you did win the war for us. And I mean, that's, that's also true. I'm not going to get into <laughs> my problems with that particular story again right now. They continue to chat for a bit, discussing what they plan on doing and what they're looking for in this base. And they come across a set of computers and it looks like they're in business. Meanwhile, back at Eggman's secret lab, he begins to pour out some containers of a very specific silver liquid, making them into what looks like backpack super soakers to hand off to Ruff and Tumble tells them that these are the backups, don't use them as a last resort, also showing them a brand new machine he wants them to take into the tunnels after Sonic. And back in those tunnels, we see that Amy has logged into the Eggnet, showing the files for a new ship, one that looks a lot like the Space Colony Ark, but is actually a lot smaller, with a lot of talk about payload distribution. But before they can figure out what it's distributing, the walls begin to shake, and Rough and Tumble come bursting through in a giant drill. More playful banter is thrown back and forth between heroes and villains, and another fun fight plays out as it has plenty of times before in the series. Sonic and Amy team up, get past the defenses of the drill, and take it out of commission. This is our third encounter with the two skunks, and it's playing out exactly as you'd expect to this point. That is until they reveal that they have a secret weapon on their backs, and they've been saving the best for last activating them with a button on their chest. But to their horror, the backpacks unleash the metal goo onto the skunks themselves. Sonic and Amy, Rough and Tumble, nobody has any idea what is happening. And Rough and Tumble are quickly transformed into Zombots. There's no more banter, there's no more tomfoolery, and no matter how much Sonic quips, they don't respond. Our two heroes are kind of at a loss for what to do, so they just keep dodging them, until Amy lands a massive blow of her hammer onto one of the skunks, leaving... <laughs> Oh my god. Giving us some body horror action here as the skunk is mutilated. His hand is sitting on the ground there. I think it's here to imply that these characters have been completely transformed on a cellular level here. As he quickly reforms as if nothing had happened. Sonic in turn goes on the offensive, spin dashing hard into the bigger skunk, leaving him another gory, gooey mess. But he, as well, reforms with zero issue, and Sonic realizes that strange metal goo has now latched onto him. He warns Amy not to touch the skunks. Now that he's already infected anyway, he launches both of them into the ravine below. Sonic is out of quips, and that cocky attitude seems to have faded as he quickly realizes he is in a lot of trouble. Whatever hit the two skunks is infectious, and it's spreading on Sonic fast. When we last left Sonic, he was attacked by the newly infected Rough and Tumble. And while they were defeated, Sonic was in turn infected himself. Would our beloved hero be turned into a mindless Zombot? Would he be taken out of the picture right at the start of this story? Leaving our supporting cast to save the world without his help? While that would be a very interesting premise, nah, he's just fine. Tangle pops by Tails' workshop and sees the hedgehog on a giant hamster wheel. And I just need to say that I absolutely love when they write Sonic doing actual hedgehog things. He is so 
removed from actual hedgehogs, as he should be. So it's just adorable when they throw in jokes like this. I also love how embarrassed Tails looks. The Sonic's like, you know, whatever. And Tangle's like, so, um... Is this, uh, what you boys get up to in your free time? Because I'm into it. As we find out, Sonic isn't showing signs of the metal infection because his speed has seemingly burned it out of his system. Yeah, two pages into the issue, and we already have a solution. What a shocker. Sonic's speed can fix time, so no reason it can't burn off a little shiny goo. And the next couple pages are basically recap. The back and forth between these characters is light and casual and still fun to read through, but doesn't really further the plot. It's just here to remind you of everything that's been happening so far. So let's not give that any more focus, because as the animal people are chatting away, we turn our attention to Eggman and Starline. And this is yet another page of setup, but it's at least advancing the plot a bit, and I do enjoy the little hints of world building that this page does. Being as ancient of a sonic boomer as I am, it's nice to see some casual explanation as to how Eggy can build a giant fortress as quickly as he does, and that's because of his badniks. Starline comments that he didn't think they were capable of such versatility, and Egg McMuffin simply states that some are built for war and some are built for construction. That's a fairly obvious explanation, but I do appreciate an explanation at all. However, Eggman also states that rounding up animals to power his badniks can be a bit tedious, but that problem will soon be solved with the metal virus. And from here, he launches his face ship. Not the Ark, not the Death Egg, the face ship. And I also love that it's just blowing its nose out of the mountain. <laughs> <laughs> and I also dig that Thanos-style throne for Eggsy, with the little Chaos Emeralds bedazzling the wall above it. The next couple pages basically explain how the ship works, so read the issue itself if you want the finer details, but basically, this ship both creates the viral goo and acts as a distributor. And just to show how much of a jerk Eggman is, his first target for the Metal Virus payload is Windmill Village, the same community that took him in as Mr. Tinker. This is the first of many, many dark moments that are to come. But can we just take a moment to appreciate how hilarious it looks when a giant face just vomits all over a town? Look how the virus drops out! Blah! We see Scruffy, the kindly village elder, do his best to shield a child from the metallic wave, but to no avail, as they quickly turn into Zombots. We see other civilians attempt to take refuge on a roof and try to help someone out of the liquid, not realizing that they are sealing their own fates. And I also need to point out here that this guy's already turning even though he's not completely covered this is a slight visual and continuity error i will point out later on in a different video next we see some actual destruction from the zombots themselves who tear through doors so they can touch people on the arm look i know it's a kid's comic but they do deflate the terror of a zombie horde when all they're really doing is using people as hand towels i recommend not thinking about it too deeply though because it will take the wind out of sails of later scenarios so let's keep going. It really took no time at all to completely take over this little village. Eggman asks Starline how he liked the show, and just in case you thought there might be any redeeming quality to this platypus, Starline calls it a transcendent experience. He is in awe of Eggman. He loved every second of this. Man. What a duckhead. With his Insta army now ready, Eggman commands them to spread the virus far and wide, and they proceed to do just that, with a little handprint on the tree reminding the reader just how serious this virus really is. And after the year that was 2020, I don't think I need to remind anybody how serious a virus can be. But when this book came out, we certainly were not ready for how horrible things would become. And the same can be said for Sonic and Friends, because the bad news isn't done rolling in. We return to Sonic as he's finalizing the next course of action with Tails and Tangle. He puts his hand up to high-five Tangle, only to see a sparkling glint just below his glove. He avoids making contact with Tangle at just the last moment. And thank goodness, because as it turns out, Sonic is still infected with the virus. His speed has only pushed it back. It has not yet been cured. So with that, Sonic rushes off but with a worried look on his face, that incessant confidence wavering. And while he's on the move, he thinks to himself that he has been in somewhat similar circumstances before, making references to Unleashed and Secret Rings, but he does note that this feels different. And buddy, you have no idea. The issue ends with the virus slowly creeping up the side of a tree, making contact with a sleeping Flicky. It awakens as a Zombot and takes flight, and the last page shows us that even the smallest infected can potentially cause massive damage, as we see the little bird making its way towards a bustling city.
So that is issue 16, and I know I skipped through quite a few pages as a lot of it was recap, but things really hit the fan in issue 17 going forward, and I felt it was important to take a breather here to really emphasize everything that's being set up in this one issue. Just a bit of a critique first though, I did have issue with the exhausting amount of time recounting things that had happened up to this issue, which is normally fine here and there for long-running comic series, but considering every issue has a recap page, this did feel excessive. Just bringing Tangle in to play audience surrogate and then in turn advertise her own mini story in the annual for a split second felt like a waste of a few pages. But also, it was good to remind readers that she does exist and her cheery mood really sets the tone for the scenes featuring Sonic and Pals. She doesn't show up very much after this issue and for good reason, because as we will see, the book takes a decidedly darker tone going forward and Tangle's endless optimism just isn't the best fit here. That's not to say she isn't in for some really amazing moments in this arc, or that her character can't work in more serious moments as we've seen in her miniseries, but I think keeping the focus off of her was the right call, because the tone she helps set when she's talking with Sonic and Tails juxtaposes brilliantly against Eggman's assault on Windmill Village, and even though we now understand the devastation that can be caused by the face ship and the virus and the looming threat it presents to Sonic himself, all of that is underplayed with Tangle cheering our heroes on. On, confident that the boys will get things sorted out. We start off positive and upbeat, sink into a cold terror with Eggman, and then come back up for air with Tangle to bookend things. Her presence here is the last glimmer of positivity these characters are going to have for a long while, with nobody, be it the cast, or the reader, hell even Eggman himself, truly understanding just how serious things are about to get. And I also want to reiterate a point I made in my Modern Sonic video, because I really like how Ian writes Eggman. And I kind of want to compare him to Robotnik from Sad AM. And look, Archie fans, I know that there's a lot of history worth untangling and sorting out with that version of Robotnik slash Robo Robotnik slash Eggman slash Reboot Eggman all in due time. But while IDW Eggman certainly has the history of video game Eggman, this is essentially a fresh start for the character. And even though the Metal Virus was originally intended for the Archie reboot era, this is also kind of a fresh start and reinterpretation of Sad AM's robotization. In the old Sad AM universe, Robotnik had taken over the world, and a large part of that was taking over not only the Kingdom of Acorn, but the ability to roboticize Mobians. It was thanks to this and this weird giant warship of his that he was able to overthrow the king and in turn take over the world of Mobius. He was so overwhelmingly powerful that Sonic and his Freedom Fighter pals would spend most of their time in hiding. So you can see some parallels between that rendition of Sonic and his story, as opposed to the IDW saga of the Metal Virus. We certainly have a lot of hindsight to really refine this idea and make it something new, but I still want to compare it to Eggman's Metal Virus. Because like I said before, if you take the modern team of Sonic characters and plot them into the Sad AM world, Robotropolis would be gone by the end of the day. I love the Freedom Fighters. I've certainly spent a great deal of time talking about how great of a character Sally is, and I will get to the rest of them in due time. But over the years, Sonic's abilities have greatly improved. And even back then, then, Sad AM left out a lot of abilities that Sonic was capable of doing in the video games, namely the Super and Hyper forms. And that's also not including Amy Rose and her Pico Hammer, or Modern Tales and his brilliance. Knuckles doesn't even exist in that world. Or Shadow. Silver. There are a lot of super-powered buddies for Sonic to bring along to take this dictator down. So in turn, to balance out that power, you need a villain who can go as hard as Dr. Eggman. Sure, he hasn't quite taken over the world outside of that one time, but when you compare robotization as opposed to the Metal Virus, the Metal Virus is far more efficient and much faster acting. This is just one of Eggman's many, many giant schemes. He's just throwing this crap out all the time. That's why Sonic and Eggman balance each other out. So no one side has more overwhelming power than the other. And that's how I see the Metal Virus. I see it as a very extra version of robotization. And I don't know about you, but that is pretty cool. And you have the extra added wrinkle of Sonic having a very severe handicap that will come into play through this entire saga. All the silver silver lining of Sonic's silver spots is that he can keep it contained with his speed, the book only alludes to what Sonic himself is about to endure. 
sure, Sonic runs fast, but have you ever asked yourself, for how long can he keep running? So we know the infection has kicked into high gear with Eggman dropping a goo load on his first town, but we don't pick up this story with him, or even with Sonic. We instead start off with a familiar setting we have not yet seen in this book. The Chaotix Detective Agency. After watching their opening cutscene in Sonic Heroes so many times during November Chaotix, I have to admit this made me smile. Going with the bird's eye view shot and everything. So yeah, we see Vector on the phone, and for what might be the very first time, we actually know who he's talking to on the other end. Tails has called him to give him the heads up about the metal virus, and he in turn passes this information on to his team, or to any reader who's randomly picking up this book. Charmy gets spooked, and who can really blame the kid? With a single touch, you can get turned into a zombie robot. It's creepy stuff. Vector reassures him that this world's a big place, probably won't even reach them. And just because this is the Chaotix, they punctuate that sentence with a Zombot crashing through the front door. BAM! Leroy Jenkins, bitches! Look, if you're gonna go out, at least do it on a perfectly timed comedic note, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Looking over this page now really hits differently after living through 2020. This virus is all the way over on the other side of the world, but then suddenly it's kicking down your front door. You got Marvel and DC desperately trying to keep up with trends, and somehow Sonic the Hedgehog is the most topical book of the modern day. What a time to be alive. Well, our boys aren't going to be taken out on an ironic punchline. They jump into action with no luck. Shurikens are no good and that idiot bug is just about to run into a zombie until Vector grabs him and tells him, no touchy. Who knew that Sonic Says segment would turn out so handy? <laughs> handy, hands, touching. This is a <laughs> really dangerous territory to joke in, so let's keep going. They make their way outside to see their city in complete chaos and the face ship just <laughs> ruling on a skyscraper. <laughs> <laughs> I can't get over that stupid thing. <laughs> like, maybe it's supposed to be intimidating, but like, you should, like, can you imagine going outside just seeing some stupid idiot face up in the sky drooling? I just, oh, man, I love it. But yeah, this is it, guys. This is the state of things going forward. No more buildup. The metal virus is here, and it's taking no prisoners. Except for, you know, its entire army of conscripted robot slaves who are prisoners within their own body. You know what? I just wanted to throw a cliche cool line in there, but I already ruined it, so never mind. Well, I gotta say, I really love the dynamic of the Chaotix and how it's written out here. As silly as Vector can get, it's here in a time of crisis, we see him look at a situation in front of him and immediately lay out a plan of action, showing why he's such a capable leader, and this won't be the only time in this story or this book in general. And here we have Espio calling out any potential weaknesses to help fine-tune things. And Vector, without missing a beat, responds in kind with his reasoning. Vector says they have to head to the docks. Espio says that they're gonna have the sea to their backs, so they're gonna be trapped. Vector responds saying like, hey, look, there's nowhere on land that's gonna be safe, and at least there we can bottleneck this situation and have a defensible location. And that's it, there's no bickering, there's no arguments. I really love how well these two work together. So yeah, Vector gives them their orders. They need to fan out, gather survivors, and bring them to the docks. And even with zombies surrounding them, they all huddle in to do a Team Chaotix shout, and man, I am hyped! Let's go, boys! We see these gents contain zombies and help out citizens, only to have Vector swarmed on all sides. But our glorious godly gator isn't gonna go out like a coward. He puts up his dukes and is rescued at the last second by Sonic the Hedgehog. Kind of forgot you were a part of this book, but, uh, you know, welcome Sonic or whatever. Yeah, so Sonic is here for the assist, reminding Vector and the reader that even though he's infected, his speed keeps it at bay. As long as he doesn't touch anybody, they'll be fine. And the two heroes part ways with Vector telling Sonic that the next time Eggman loses his memory, he's getting locked up. And this will be the most mild of dress downs Sonic is going to get from his friends for being too lenient on Tinker. We then shift our attention back to Espio and Charmy, leading people towards the docks, until it's discovered that among the survivors is an infected, this color variant Tangle. Okay, so it's not actually Tangle, she's not actually given a name, but I'm gonna go ahead and call her Karen, because she's being selfish and putting the safety of everybody around 
around her at risk. She's got a silver booger that she can't wipe off her arm and it's grossing everybody out. She begins to panic. She doesn't want to be left behind. And Charmy and Espio pause. This is a very morally confusing situation. They're not sure what to do. But our boy Vector comes in and makes an executive decision and slams down cars all around her to cut her off from the rest of the group. I and mean, she's freaking out. She's scared. And who can blame her? But she's going to infect everybody else. Social distancing is a thing, Karen. Now you're stuck in a car cage. Charmy is real upset with Vector because he's a stupid idiot baby bee. Maybe just listen to your reptile daddies on this one, buddy. We spend the next couple pages with Sonic, who points out that the rescue shuttle has arrived and then just goes and runs off the infection. This really eats up more panels than it probably should, but it is here to let you know how much of a handicap Sonic has in this situation. Outside of not being able to touch anybody, and while yes, normally that is no good, his speed could rush survivors out of danger much quicker if he could just pick them up and get out of there. That's not an option, and outside of that, he always needs to keep moving. Sure, already being infected means he can make direct contact with Zombots, but as we will find out a little bit later, the more contact he makes, the faster his infection spreads, and in turn, he needs to stop and just zip off somewhere to run this stuff off. But yeah, I don't really think we needed three pages dedicated to just watching him run off somewhere, but I guess his name's on the book, so gotta hit that quota. But that said, I gotta take a moment to once again appreciate how smart this book is when it comes to writing a video game character. I'm not about to tell you that Sonic the Hedgehog is the cream of the crop in terms of all of comic book storytelling. But in terms of talking about a franchise based around a video game, they do a pretty brilliant job here because they keep coming up with characters and concepts and situations where I would love to see interpreted in a video game. We've talked about Tangle and Whisper, potential boss fights with these new bad guys. And now when I read stuff like this, I gotta say, the Sonic infection angle, that would be really cool in a Zombot video game. It makes me think of trying to build up speed in Sonic CD to travel through time. I get that it might be an annoying gimmick for an entire game, but kind of like Majora's Mask, having to be under these very specific parameters can either make or break a game for you. I feel like if done properly, Sonic having to run down his infection while keeping track of how many characters he's running into, I think all that could play into a brilliant set of mechanics. And we have seen this through literally every story of IDW Sonic so far. It tells good stories that not only make sense in Sonic's universe, or at least the little vague universe that we can be provided with thanks to the games at the same time incorporating their own ideas because these are fans and you can tell and I just appreciate that well that's enough of a distraction from me and from Sonic as we turn our attention back to the chaotics who are guiding survivors into the docked shuttle Charmy is taking a head count and deciding that there just aren't enough people here decides that now that these people who are safe are where they need to be he's gonna go back and help the rest starting with Karen who is stuck between all those cars and he's He's doing this because he's a stupid idiot insect. Disobeying direct orders from Vector, Charmy rushes back to the pin Karen and well, would you look at that? She has turned into a Zombot and then grabs Charmy, who is then dragged down to be swarmed by Zombot screaming for Vector and Espio to come rescue him. You guys remember that one time I made a video about all the horrible ways Charmy's lived life through all these different canons? Some of you in the comments were wondering, where's IDW Charmy? Are you gonna talk about IDW Charmy? You seem to have missed out on IDW Charmy. Well, no folks, that was intentional. I didn't want to spoil it because we had not yet covered it in Sonic speed reading, but we are now. Sure, this isn't brain damage or losing his entire royal family, but there's a new canon for Charmy to exist in, and in turn, there's a new chance to make him suffer. He has now become the very first member of the core Sonic game cast to become a victim of the Zombots. Right as things were really kicking off, he's just taken off the table. <laughs> that sucks, man. And like, no, he's not getting ripped apart, but this is clearly a visual nod to those old gory zombie movies where you get swarmed and get torn apart. It's just... <laughs> Oh, man. And he's so scared and he's screaming for his reptile daddies. And oh, God, the man, 
This bug can't catch a break. Oh my goodness. Now, one could argue that he's acting a little bit out of character to help further the plot along. He's clearly seen the danger of the Zombots, and he flat out ignores Vector to go run back into the action. But it's not like we have that much to go off in terms of the games, and they did build this up quite well through this issue. So I didn't really think it was too egregious, if at all. Thank goodness this is the only example I can think of of a character acting completely out of character to help push along this narrative. The shuttle takes off with a distraught Vector and Espio forced to leave behind their bug. And that's issue 17. And that is the tone we are setting for the rest of this tale. So buckle up, kids, because we're in a rough transition into a global pandemic. I also want to point out that they previewed a Ninja Turtle comic in this issue that features basically roboticized animal men. So I, I mean, if Sonic's not going to use it, somebody ought to, whatever. Let's carry right on into issue 18, where Cream the Rabbit makes her IDW debut. And what perfect timing to introduce the most innocent, adorable child character of the Sonic universe. I'm sure we're in for a heartwarming little tale. And don't worry, all of her associated characters are here as well, including Vector's Wabbit Waifu, Cream's mother, Vanilla, and the two Chows, Cheese and Chocola. And hey, even General's here. Their village is being overrun, and Sonic is here to track down Cream and her family to get them to safety. Eggy, meanwhile, is strategically dropping the virus in spots where Sonic is going to have to run through if he wants to hit up more populated areas to save people. And he then decides to mess with Sonic even more by instructing all of his Zombots to swarm on the Hedgehog's location. But as it turns out, the Zombots are becoming less and less responsive to his commands as the virus spreads. Starline is a bit stressed at the prospect of losing control over their Zombots, but Eggman isn't fussed. It is a virus after all, it was bound to mutate, and they're safe up in their face ship. Virus is doing its job, they'll sort it out later. And while he goes off to find something to eat, we get this really interesting little back and forth between Orbot and Starline. The platypus confides that he has always looked up to Eggman, and has always assumed that Sonic was only able to topple him because of Sonic's overwhelming power. But now that he has met his hero face to face, this has shown him that Eggman seems to be his own worst enemy. He doesn't ever plan for the long term, he just lives in the moment. And Orbot's like, yeah, pretty much. If it's not Eggman himself, it's Sonic coming in to say, the day. They do their routine, they do their song and dance, and while the track lineup might change, it's still basically the same set. I also love that Starline is venting to a sentient robot free to make its own decisions and judgments, a robot created by Eggman. Like seriously, I don't think we appreciate how technically brilliant the creation of Orbot and Cubot actually are. He's venting about Eggman to an Eggman creation, that's super interesting. And also, I kind of feel like Starline doesn't have anybody else to talk to, so they they gotta use somebody. Man, no, Orbot and Cubot are not getting their own video. I don't actually care that much. We then have a little bit of a tussle between Sonic and Gemeral, giving us a little more information while removing a potential out for Sonic with this virus. Gemeral detects the same infection in Sonic as with all these Zombots surrounding him, so he's on the attack, considering him an immediate threat since the virus has spread over half of Sonic's body. And Jemmy's machine fusion technique is a no-go here. Gemeral can't control the virus so the only logical conclusion is that he needs to eliminate the threat, including Sonic and the other carriers. But Sonic did explain to him that running does keep it in check and leave it to a robot to be the voice of reason. He can detect the level of infection within Sonic and if it's true that running gets it under control, then Sonic needs to go and run. And Sonic tries to argue, saying that he's being a real jerk and he's just trying to help out, and Gemeral tells him to get lost, and then arms his missiles. I <laughs> love this robot. With Sonic out of the way, Gemeral proceeds to attack Zombots, until Cream jumps in and kinda lays out for the robot that these are victims, and Gem Gem is gonna have to protect Cream without hurting anybody. And while this next part might be a little over-explained for some readers, keep in mind that this is still a kid's book, and this is a fairly good lesson. I'm not sure when you can really apply it in the real world with the zombies, but still, it's a good lesson for kids, and it also provides us a little bit of background for these characters. So it all mixes in fairly well. Basically, Cream tells Gemeral that the 
these Zombots aren't in control of themselves. They're being forced to do this by Eggman. And General, who is a creation of Eggman, was once forced to fight Sonic and his friends. And once Tails got a hold of them and fixed him, he's now their friend. And these Zombots, in turn, need a chance to be fixed as well. And in this context, General can understand Cream's logic. So he agrees to take a non-lethal route and starts putting some distance between the Zombots and Cream. But at the same time, the little rabbit hears her own mother scream from within their house. And with General having his hands full in Smokey the Hedgehog, teaching kids the importance of not starting forest fires in an attempt to quell zombie apocalypses, she runs off to help her mother on her own. I gotta say, I didn't really like this weird scene where Sonic runs by kids attempting to start a forest fire. I'm not sure anybody was really asking the question, why wouldn't they just set all the Zombots on fire? I think this is more here to explain to readers that while Cream is a young girl, she is still allowed to go on adventures with Sonic because she's real cool, I guess? I don't know. I always thought this was weird. I don't know why you bring attention to it. Like, if it's not Ian, it's Evan in a later arc. They try to explain why Cream is hanging out with these older adventuring characters. And I guess I kind of appreciate them trying to bring logic into this, but we see through Cream's actions in this book that she more than justifies that on her own terms. I really don't need them to stop everything and explain that to the reader. It's jarring and it's weird. But anyway, yeah, back to Cream herself. She heads back into the house and Vanilla is about to be swarmed by Zombots. But the Chows come to the rescue and unfortunately we're not done infecting the cute flying characters of the Sonic universe as Cheese and Chocola get grabbed by a zombie. Zombot. Yep, very first issue we are introduced to these characters and they zombify the little Chow sidekick as he waves goodbye to a crying cream who is being carried out of the house by her mother while Sonic keeps the bots at bay. And while the Zombot stuff when you really think about it, isn't too different from other zombifying or monsterifying tropes we've seen countless times in other children's cartoons or comic books or just pop culture in general. It's moments like this that I feel really resonated with readers and hit them on a really emotional level. We'll get into greater detail when I discuss this in review as a whole when we get to the end of this entire storyline. And I know Ian's gone into greater detail and I think fairly recently in his podcast, but even though they're not showing you blood and gore, it's how these characters react to these situations that really hits us as hard as it does. These are silly, fun cartoon characters, and we are given very rare opportunities to see them in completely stressful situations or witness these moments that really break their hearts. And seeing cute little Cream react to her best friend basically die in front of her eyes, and then have Sonic talk a child through their grief so they can survive this situation that they're currently in, that hits on a more human level than a book full of blood and gore, you know? That's why this book feels more violent than it actually is. And it really humanizes these characters in ways that the games rarely tend to do, especially for less important characters like Cream the Rabbit. And at the same time, in a situation like this, it really shows why Cream is a hero, because she does compose herself and then gets her and her mother out of there on her giant flappy ears. Look, I know we have helicopter tuckuses and hairstyles that allow you to glide in this universe, but seeing Cream dumbo her way out of a zombie horde is still kind of hilarious to me. <laughs> Oh man. All right, it's basically wrap up at this point. Sonic points General in the direction of the rabbits and contains the infected Chow, pointing out how problematic flying Zombots could be. At the same time, Rouge gets in contact with him, letting the Hedgehog know that Team Dark is en route to Sunset City. So that's where he sets off as we see the Chow break free from their elaborate jar prisons. I mean, have you seen what Cheese can do in the advanced games? Did you really think that was gonna make a difference? Welcome back to Sonic Speed Reading, and welcome to Crisis City, also known as Sunset City, as Rouge explains to Sonic for some reason. What a great name, I think I'll steal that and use it for a podcast. Yeah, I know this is just here to explain what this place is and give some weight to the importance of it for the reader and, you know, a little bit of world building here. It's, it's cute, it's fine, it's just, I don't know why Rouge is explaining this to Sonic. I also love at the end of the page, we see some of the Zombots climbing up the side of buildings. And this shows us that nowhere is actually safe from these things, like they can just crawl up the side 
ahead of buildings with ease, but they just look like they got distracted and just decided to go dink around somewhere else. It, just, it looks funny to me. I don't know. Anyway, we waste no time with the action as we see Sonic spinball his way through a horde. He's trying to make his way through this mess to find survivors. And also quickly remind the reader that the more he touches Zombots, the more his own virus spreads, so he has to be careful. And he does indeed find survivors on the upper floors of these buildings, and as we just saw, Zombots can reach them, so Sonic can't waste any time, he's gotta get him out of there. But just as he's about to pave his way through some zombie boys, a rain of gunfire impedes his movement. Turns out, Omega has shown up, and if you don't know anything about Omega, he's a rogue Eggman badnik who uh, hates Eggman and all of his badniks. To Omega, these are all Eggman robots, and therefore must be eliminated. Sonic tries to explain that these are not the normal badniks. These are innocent people that have been transformed by the metal virus. And... <laughs> <laughs> and then we see one of Ian Flynn's strengths when it comes to characters. I love the way he writes Omega, because he just holds up one of these stupid Zombots and just asks Sonic, is this a robot? Sonic's kind of stuttered around, like, yeah, I mean, I guess. Was this created by Eggman? Well, I mean, technically. Well, then it must be destroyed, shouldn't it? Cut and dry. I love the robots of this series. <laughs> but Sonic's going to leave him be, because as it turns out, Omega's not actually doing anything to these guys. At this point, Rouge makes contact with Sonic directly, and in turn, they start directing survivors towards the truck so they can get him out of town. They meet up at Grand Gold Flicky Hotel. Oh, I love that statue. And here, Sonic and Rouge kind of catch each other up a little bit here. Rouge points out that this assault seems a little sloppy, even for Eggman standards, and Sonic points out that it's because that he's no longer controlling the Zombots. Sonic asks about Shadow's location, and Rouge responds that he's off to pick up a truck. How sweet. We then have some more survivors get to the barricade, and again, this is reminding readers that Sonic can't touch anybody, so he's got to get creative with how he deals with Zombots and saving people's lives. He runs into Omega again, asking him what he thinks he's doing. He's got to keep Zombots away from the hotel, and Omega tells him that there are too many targets, the enemies advancing from both directions. Because that's right, there's a second wave of Zombots coming in. Sonic's about ready to deal with them, but then he notices a large mass making its way through the horde. It's a semi. Of course it is. And from it steps Shadow the Hedgehog, looking quite pissed. Sonic tries to sass him, and Shadow's not having any of it. Sonic tries to tell him to chill out because he was joking. And again, Shadow is just not in the mood. He points out that if he had destroyed Eggman in Windmill Village, none of this would be happening. And then I guess Sonic's trying to go for a pity because he's like, hey, I'm dealing with the infection too. And <laughs> Shadow's like, you get what you deserve, bro. I don't know what to tell you. I mean, look how pissed Sonic is. He can't refute any of this. And I can't really blame Shadow for being ticked off with the guy. And you would think from here, we would get an interesting dynamic between the two. But let's keep going. Sonic, realizing that this isn't the time or place to get into it with Shadow, tells him that he's gonna go take care of his infection, thanks him for bringing the truck, and tells him not to let the Zombots touch him. Shadow says, I know. And Sonic says, if it happens, you should be fast enough to run it off like me. To which Shadow responds, cowards run, I win. Yeah, that seems about on point for Shadow. Let's keep going. Shadow touches base with Omega, giving him some orders on how to contain the situation, leaving Shadow to take on the Zombot Horde himself. To which he shoots some lights at him, and kicks him with his shoes and flips around, I guess. I don't really know what he's actually accomplishing, but, you know, whatever. We get back to Rouge, who's directing survivors towards the truck, notices that Shadow's making a mess within the middle of the horde, points out that he's being reckless, as we know Shadow to be. Nothing wrong here, nothing whatsoever. And then we get back to Shadow, who is just fighting Zombots, pointing out that they're quite resilient as <laughs> he's straight up... <laughs> Oh man, he straight up curb stomps a zombie with those sweet kicks of his and gets up with a Picasso face. Being impressed, Shadow decides to show off his sick breakdancing skills and also points out that the metal virus can't infect the ultimate life form. I don't know where he got the data for that, but sure. This is all on the up and up so far. No problems whatsoever. We then get back to Sonic who is running around on the outskirts of town and pointing out something we I don't think have ever seen in the comics, unless I'm mistaken. 
taken. He's actually getting winded. He takes a quick second to reflect on everything he's lost and wonders if it's his own fault, and then quickly points out to himself that no, he can't be blamed for the actions of others, and then zips back into town. Cut back to Shadow, who is zipping his way through the Zombots again, and then just, just grabs one, I guess. I, I don't know why, he just decides, I'm gonna touch this one and throw it into other ones. And wouldn't you know it, he's got some icky goo all over him. Anyway, Shadow now has the infection, and Rouge tells him, run, she and Omega will hold things down from here. And Shadow says, I don't run, and begins to just straight up punch Zombots. Totally in line with everything we know about Shadow so far. No problems here. Omega can't provide backup for Shadow because there are just way too many of them for him to take care of. And, well, once you know it, Shadow gets overtaken by the Horde. Sonic makes his way back into the middle of town, and Rouge tells Sonic to handle Shadow. And Sonic's like, handle? I think you're the only one he listens to. Which he clearly didn't. But as Sonic finds out, what Rouge actually meant was that he had to take care of Zombot Shadow. Yeah, totally fine. No problems here. Okay, so before we break down everything we just witnessed, let's carry on through issue 20 first. We're going to spend most of our time with Sonic versus Zombot Shadow. Sonic quickly overpowers Shadow, pointing out that a healthy Shadow would have seen that move coming and countered it. But now he has to deal with Shadow on top of a bajillion Zombots. They fight for a little bit and Sonic sends him off into a crowd of Zombots. And Sonic's quickly getting tuckered out. The situation has become completely uncontrollable, so Sonic just tells Rouge to take off and he'll hold off the Zombots best he can. At this point, Omega jumps into the fray to help out. Or well, that's what Sonic assumes anyway. Omega's actually here because Eggman wrote robots remain and this must be corrected violently <laughs> again read this book for yourself the way they write omega is just fantastic but while they're dealing with all these zombots sonic notice that shadow isn't there and then notices <laughs> and then notices he's chasing after the truck <laughs> just look, look at this <laughs> He just looks like a distracted dog chasing down a car. <laughs> like if they'd done it from the perspective of the truck or like closer to Shadow, like making it really seem scary and dangerous, but it's all in the background. <laughs> I don't know, but it's just me. He just looks ridiculous. Oh my god. Oh, that's great. Sonic does his best to redirect Shadow back into the party, but as he quickly learns, Shadow is not a normal Zombot and chucks Sonic to the side. Omega and Sonic are quickly losing ground here, and Omega points out that Sonic's infection is getting worse and he should run off. Sonic's telling him that he's not going to abandon a friend, and Omega responds that we are not friends. You're in the way of my massacre. I love this robot. Sonic points out the obvious that Omega Omega's ammo isn't actually getting anything done, so how about they just get out of there while they still have energy? And Omega just flat out refuses, and then grabs Shadow by the face and just smothers his face into the ground like the bad dog he is. Gotta rub his nose in it. Sonic points out, wait, that's Shadow. And Omega's like, nope, he's another robot. Don't care. And Shadow responds in kind by just ripping apart Omega. Oh my goodness. Sonic tries to reason with Shadow Zombot and it's not going well at all. And quickly, Omega is getting torn apart and Sonic is being overpowered by Shadow and the other Zombots. But thankfully, at the last moment, he's saved by the return of Silver. As you might recall, he was taken out of commission when they first took on Starline, but looks like he's fully recovered, and Tails is with him as well. With his telekinetic abilities, he gets all the Zombots floating around him and clears away so Sonic can get out of there. Tails in turn picks up the head of Omega, the only thing that remains, but thankfully, that sass is still intact. But Shadow's not having any of it, as he leaps off the side of the building and almost makes contact with Silver. Thankfully, he doesn't, and the two fly boys get right the hell out of there. So Sonic has gotten the survivors out of there, but at the cost of a couple of allies. They meet up at Restoration HQ, and at this point, it's really Sonic just touching base with all the other surviving main cast characters. Starting off with Cream, who seems to be in decent spirits, despite the fact that she recently lost her two Chow. She catches Sonic up with what's happening at Restoration HQ, pointing out that there are a lot of refugees and not a lot of room for them, and everyone's kind of in a bummer mood. But she's doing her best with snacks and candies, 
she's in doing her best to remain happy, so in turn, everybody else will be happy as well. She guides Sonic over to Amy Rose's office, and General points out that Sonic is still infected, therefore he's denied access, until Cream scolds him, and they let him on through. Amy, who's been recently made charge of restoration, is clearly in over her head, and she's doing her best. Sonic heads over to Rouge, who asks him about Shadow, and Sonic responds, sorry, he's gone. Now that Amy's off the phone, her and Sonic catch up. But the reunion is short-lived as she goes back to the radio, and I guess Echo 3, Echo 13, and Echo 11 went down on Turtle Shell Island. Oh man, I should have named my podcast Turtle Shell Island. I want to go to Turtle Shell Island? Oh, anyway, yep, yeah, Sonic leaves because he's all bummed out. Turns out everything's going pretty garbagey for the entire world. He then runs into Vector and Espio, who have just woken up from their naps. They in turn ask him how he's doing, and Sonic points out that he's taking little naps here and there, but he can't really do much else than that, otherwise the infection's gonna take hold of him. They part ways off to find Charmy, as they still don't know what happened to him, even though we know what did. The clearly exhausted Sonic then touches base with Tails and Silver. And now that Silver's awake, there's something Sonic's been wanting to discuss, namely why he's come back from the future again. Sonic points out that Silver had mentioned that his world was all metallic and lifeless, and wonders if this was because of the metal virus. Silver is confident that that is the case, but Sonic doesn't remember Silver mentioning any Zombots. Silver responds that it's because he didn't see any, and he's hoping that that won't be a mystery they have to solve. Sonic then sees how Omega is doing, who's just being a violent head, so he's fine. Tails points out that he can rebuild him, but it's going to take some time because Eggman Tech is notoriously weird. But now we get to the actual point of why Sonic is here bothering his best bud, Tails. Today was a close call. It was probably the worst that Sonic has dealt with in terms of the zombie virus so far, and we have to know if Tails is any closer to finding a cure for this entire mess. Unfortunately, Tails just doesn't have enough data, but he might have a means to collect more. Tails points out that Sonic Speed is somehow combating the metal virus. It isn't completely, but it is consistently holding it back. So, he built a nice little biometric sensor that Sonic can wear on his wrist. So, basically a Fitbit. Long and short of it, Tails is going to take readings from Sonic while he's running out and about in the world to see if they can find some sort of solution from him. So, while everything seems to be going to pot, we might still yet have a chance to beat this thing, which is all the hope Sonic really needs right now. He's kind of desperate for it. He looks really tuckered out. But we end things with Dr. Starline, who we haven't seen for the last couple issues. He sits by himself, somewhat dejected, having to admit to himself that Eggman has no plan to control the virus. They've got some tests scheduled for tomorrow, but Starline still feels like Eggman's overlooked or forgotten one of his many, many assets. So he digs through his files to see if there's anything that can help get this virus in check and comes across the Lost World Project. Well, I wonder if anything's going to come from that. And I wonder if we're going to see the return of a fan favorite villain. But that is where we are going to end things in terms of coverage for today. But we're not going to wrap up the episode just yet. I did say at the front that I wanted to wait till the end of the Zombot virus saga before I kind of give my general thoughts on the story altogether. That said, I also pointed out that we would stop at some point to really pick apart and analyze one specific subject. And that subject is Shadow because this has been a hot topic for fans for quite a while, and I can't just flat out ignore it, so let's get into it. Okay, so to anyone looking from the outside in, you might be wondering, what exactly is the big deal here? If you don't know any better, you just see this guy as another Dark Mirror villain. It's a well-worn trope at this point. Hell, even an expectation. If you have a protagonist, you need to have an evil version of them running around somewhere. And Shadow looks to be just that, or at least that's what your average person would assume just by taking in his design. And in terms of story, almost everything makes sense here, especially through the lens of tropey zombie fiction. But for longtime Sonic fans, Shadow fans specifically, this felt very out of character. Shadow's actions in this comic goes against a lot of what has been established back in the adventure era of the games. Because let's be real, if you love those games, you probably love Shadow the Hedgehog, because the narrative through line was Shadow. We get to know what makes him tick, uncover 
discover his origins and purpose, and most importantly, we get to see him grow as a character, more so than anyone else in those stretch of games. Those are sometimes called the Dark Ages of the Sonic franchise, and while not a fan of that term, you could take it quite literally, because all of those games revolve around the Dark Hedgehog. Even when he's just a part of the ensemble cast, his narrative is usually the most interesting portion of the game's story. He was the badass new bad guy who turned out to have a lot more going on under that moody exterior. And I've gone on record saying I'm not the biggest fan of the stories told in those games, but I like them well enough to certainly understand why people attached to those projects as passionately as they did. We were in a brave new era of video game storytelling, and for a lot of kids of the day, this was their first taste of more complex characters, plots, and motivations. It's honestly no wonder there are so many fans of this era despite them being as notorious as they were in the wider gaming world. And adventure fans generally focus a lot more on the story than fans of the earlier classic games or later boost games, because the story was a major focus of the adventure games. So it's not much of a surprise many of them would turn to the comics for a more compelling narrative, especially in a time when many of those adventure fans have not been too happy with some more recent game scripts. And that's kind of the point of all these comics. You can't play a comic, you're here because you love these characters, and you want to spend a little more time with them in their world. But that only works when those characters are staying true to, well, their character. And here we have Shadow acting arrogant and reckless, easily one of the most powerful characters in the cast, and he's taken out by grabbing a Zombot? What? He ignores Sonic, he ignores his teammates, and he ignores a lot of his own history in terms of tackling desperate situations such as this. So yeah, I get why a lot of fans are really upset with this issue. Under all of that dark fur lies the heart of a hero, loyal to a fault, cunning, and tactical. Yet here he is, getting taken out from his own sloppiness. So, yeah, you can understand the frustration. But at the same time, I also get why he was taken out like this. There's a frustrating truth the early 2000s fans are going to have to accept. Shadow has undergone something of a soft reboot. All of these characters have. There's a reason he went from sounding like this... If the world chooses to become my enemy, I will fight like I always have. To this. I see no villains. Just some fools whose only ability is wasting time. Nothing against the voice actor here, but there's an obvious direction Sega is trying to take this character. And I hate to tell you guys, I kind of understand why. Like I said, if you did not know any better, you can make certain assumptions about Shadow's personality from his design. And as a kid's property, I'd get why you'd want to easily identify Shadow and his place in the Sonic cast. The Sonic franchise revolves around Sonic. That might sound weird, but if you go back to the adventure era, I'd argue that those games largely revolve around Shadow. But nowadays, they rely more on Sonic than ever before. It's no longer about Shadow's backstory and character arc. It's now back to Sonic and, well, he's got to play the part of the cool, charming hero and the voice of reason and the guy making all of the plans. And yes, that is a bigger topic for another time. Wait till the end of all of this. But my point is that we are reading a story with the current interpretations of these characters. And unfortunately, the writers of this licensed property have to work within those guidelines. These are not Ian Flynn's characters, and it's entirely up to Sega whether or not they stay true to the pre-established stories or if they take Shadow in a new direction. I only bring this up because I see a lot of people use this issue to yell about Ian Flynn not understanding these characters when we have seen him write Shadow perfectly fine with an Archie canon. Yes, every writer is going to have a slightly different spin on this franchise, but at the end of the day, it's up to Sega to determine the overall direction. Flynn's been upfront about this, and no, I don't think he's lying, because that probably would wouldn't do well for Sega if he was lying about the company giving him the paychecks. But that does not excuse this book from criticism. Even with these guidelines in place, there's definitely some weak points worth discussing. You're telling me that Shadow didn't jump into the situation without a game plan, doesn't coordinate with the rest of Team Dark, wasn't updated on Sonic's situation, and how he's keeping it in check? I mean, I get we get these little scenes with Sonic talking with Shadow and Rouge, and it seems like this is the first time they got the information that him running this stuff off is what's keeping it in check, but it's also kind of inconsistent with the way Shadow
Shadow reacts to them telling him to run. And I also think it's weird that Tails would call the Chaotix and give them the heads up, but he wouldn't call Team Dark first. Rouge contacted Sonic through a headset and gave him the heads up on Sunset City, so there's clearly been some coordination between all these different factions. So why on earth would they not know about Sonic's infection and how he's handling it prior to him interacting with them? And then Shadow gets infected by grabbing a Zombot? So do his gloves count as organic material? Why wasn't he infected when he was spinballing through them? And yes, I know all of this is nitpicking, all right? I know. But if you're going to spend so much time establishing the rules, then you need to follow your own rules. And I get the point of this. Shadow is too powerful of a character to leave unchecked, so you need to take him off the board if you want to keep raising the stakes for Sonic. But when you're making it blatantly obvious that you're making these situations happen in service to the plot, then you have a little bit of a problem with the script. These are overall just tiny hiccups here and there, but they add up quickly. Like, for real, Rouge knew Shadow was infected completely, and then asked Sonic about Shadow later on in headquarters? Like she didn't see him turn? She told Sonic to go take care of Shadow. Did we forget all of that just so we could see this reaction from Rouge? It's not like he was going to save him or something. So yes, the issue done goofed, because we know that Shadow is a powerful character, and we know we have to get him out of the way. And honestly, when I first read through it, I just rolled with it because I've read so many stories like this, and I knew where they were going with it. But I also have a problem with Zombot Shadow, because yeah, I was expecting Shadow to get infected, and I was expecting a Zombot Shadow fight. And I'll give him this, he was more dangerous of a Zombot than the regular ones, and Sonic probably would have lost if it wasn't for a last minute save from Silver. But I don't know, I kind of felt like there could have been a little bit more done in terms of making Shadow a particularly dangerous type of Zombot. Like yes, we are constantly worried about Sonic turning into a Zombot, but this book is very clearly keeping most of the focus from Sonic's perspective. And even without Rocket Boots, this would have been a great chance to show how dangerous things could get if Sonic were to turn. They just escaped Sunset City, which is fine. They didn't actually win that battle. But I kind of feel like Shadow should be treated like a next level type of threat. This is the zombie apocalypse of the Sonic universe. The story and the threat itself shouldn't revolve entirely around Shadow. I'm not saying that, but Shadow should be something that Sonic's crew constantly have to worry about. Like they either need to constantly stay on the move because he just covers ground way too quickly, or they are forced into a situation where they have to contain him because Shadow is spreading the virus as quickly as an entire town of Zombots would all on his own. And I'm sure scheduling was tight. Again, the focus is not on Shadow. It's on the Zombot arc, but I don't know. Reading through these last two issues, I kind of felt like the pacing was a little bit off and we might have spent a little bit too much time reconnecting with all the characters and what they were doing when we could have done that in these next upcoming issues. The storyline does drag quite a bit and there are definitely some weak spots in these Shadow-centric stories. But if I gotta be honest with you guys, I overall did not have much of a problem with this whatsoever. I've become somewhat used to this interpretation of Shadow, and it's not like he's just going to be a Zombot forever. And honestly, I don't even think he's going to be this cranky forever. Also, this probably didn't bother me a whole lot because this isn't even the worst we've seen of the character. I am Shadow Android, the ultimate battle life form created by Eggman. You may have created me, Doctor, but I will now lead this empire and androids will rule! This is who I am! What?! It sucks when one of your favorite characters is being reinterpreted in a way that doesn't work for you, especially when they do soft reboots, yet still expect you to keep everything that happened before as canon. But that's kind of what happens with long-running franchises. I'm not saying you just have to grin and bear it. I think it's important to express your frustrations and your criticisms, but I also think it's important where you're expressing them too. Ian Flynn is more than aware that you were not happy with the way Shadow was interpreted. And again, I keep telling you guys, take a listen to the Bumblecast because he has gone on record multiple times saying, that he's not too happy with what he's supposed to do with Shadow. That doesn't excuse these scripts. If you don't like them, you don't like them, and that is fine. I know there were some plans to have Shadow take off his containment rings and just go nuts like he did with all the Mephilus copies in Sonic 06, but yeah, ultimately that didn't happen. I've been mulling over this particular topic for quite a while. There's a reason why I did the Super Shadow video when I did, just to kind of point out to you guys that I'd like to think I understand what makes this character so special to everybody, just so when I finally covered this, I wouldn't sound completely off base when I told 
you I wasn't bothered that much by this story. No, I'm not the biggest fan of this interpretation of Shadow, but at the same time, I also don't want him to be quite as much of a hero as he was in the Adventure Era as well. I kinda like a Shadow who is a proper rival to Sonic. I kinda like a little Vegeta in that mix, cause I kinda like Vegeta, I'm sorry. But I think there's a middle ground we have not yet struck with this character, and despite all the bashing everyone's done with Sonic Forces, I think it's important to look at how Shadow was interpreted in that game. Again, not quite as well as he was back in the Adventure Era, but I definitely think we're moving closer to something that everyone can be happy with. Sega tends to overcorrect when it comes to their games, and I'm hoping that the little more Shadow we're seeing from Forces and from the comics and from the reaction to how Shadow handled this situation, because yes, they do address it. I think all of this is pointing towards the signs that hopefully sooner rather than later, we're going to have a Shadow that can be Sonic's dark rival, and at the same time can be his own person, one that we're compelled to follow and enjoy and doesn't feel like an idiot when he's in the middle of a situation like this. I think my actual issue with all of this is just how Sonic is interpreted in the more modern age. Like I said, he's got to be the hero on every level for everybody. It really feels like this entire world revolves around him as opposed to him existing in this larger, grander world, which I kind of miss about the Archie series. I kind of miss Sonic being a little bit of a dick or being a little flippant or rushing too quickly into a situation. I kind of wanted a story that I thought I would get when I saw the cover of this comic book, where we see Team Dark trying to get survivors away from Zombots, and Shadow looks pissed because Sonic doesn't look like he's taking the situation seriously. I mean, there's like a hundred different ways you could have Shadow get infected that would have been fine for people. I don't even think he needed to take off his rings. Maybe he's really honestly pissed with Sonic because technically his inaction helped enable the situation. I think that is a great way to have these two characters come at odds with each other, and I would have liked to see more of that play out. I would have loved to see that expanded upon. And when Shadow finally turns, I don't know. You could have had Sonic accidentally bump into him, or Shadow going out of his way to stop Sonic from going fully converted because he knows how dangerous Sonic would be as a Zombot. I don't know. I'm just spitting off the top of my head. I'm not sitting in front of this, and I'm just using hindsight. But my point is, there was a lot of potential story worth telling between these two characters and a lot of decent excuses to have them be at odds with each other without it sacrificing the core ideals of Shadow that we know so far. But again, I haven't seen Sega's notes. I have no idea what's been said to Ian about the direction of the character. And ultimately, at the end of the day, Shadow is not the most important character in this storyline. And he has, whether you like it or not, stayed pretty consistent for his characterization in the IDW canon. Yes, it's spun off from the main core game canon, but this is still its own story, and Shadow's been a little bit crankier for this past decade, whether you like it or not. So, while I'm not the happiest I could be with it, and while I do think there could have been better ways to get to the end goal they were going for, I'm still overall okay with it. It was still a fun, crazy, chaotic mess, and this is where the book really feels like things are about to get really bad, because we're starting to see Sonic get tired and worried and stressed, and I think that would make a bigger impact if he was a lot more flippant and foolish prior to this point, like trying to hold back his own guilt for the situation by being brash and arrogant and all this other stuff we've known Sonic to be in the past. I don't know, I'm sure Ian Flynn has his own hundreds of different ways he would have liked to do this particular story, but again, when you're writing a licensed property, you don't have as many options as you would like. It's a bigger challenge than people give it credit for. Critique this issue, make of it what you will, and yes, if there are ways the writers could have improved, even with in their own given guidelines, then yeah, I don't think it's too much to ask them to step the game up. Just understand there are guidelines in place. But yeah, that's just gonna about wrap up all my thoughts about this notorious moment in IDW Sonic history. I get why it's there, and I hope I picked it apart well enough that I can validate those frustrations and explain them away, but at the same time, like I said at the start, when I first read through this, I didn't even blink an eye. I thought Shadow kind of went out like a bitch, but I also kind of expected him to go out. So he got some cool hits in, he did some cool extra stuff as a Zombot, and I would have liked more, and I would have liked some stuff done a little bit differently, but at the same time, the overall pressing issue of the Zombot threat is far more interesting to me, and I'm sure that this is just going to be a weak point in the history of Shadow the Hedgehog. This character isn't going anywhere, and whether or not you like a current interpretation of him, just remember, that's not always going to be the case. Express your frustrations, express your criticisms, help the writers and the IP holders and everybody else guide these characters in a way 
attribute that facilitates the fan base because there's a reason you fell in love with these characters and honestly if those reasons shine through there's no reason they can't build that fan base but at the same time don't let it ruin your day don't let this silly moment ruin an entire storyline or comic series for you if this was literally all it took to make you swear off idw sonic well i'm sorry you're missing out on a lot of great stories here and while it might not be true to what games have interpreted shadow like literally almost 20 years ago it still works well enough within the canon provided by the comic book so far so yeah not my favorite thing in the world but ain't gonna ruin my day now these next few issues all take place at the same time, but that doesn't mean they're just spinning their wheels. Each issue actually follows the events from a different character's perspective, and they all pertain to some very important events, and, well, you'll see. Okay, as you might see from this cover, they are indeed using a chow to show off a scary zombie image. I just, oh, who would have thought we'd see this? My goodness. And yeah, as you can see, the first story is going to revolve around Tails, as he attempts to come up with a cure for the virus. We go back in time just a little bit to Central City as it was first being invaded by Eggman. Yes, only an hour has passed after everything else we've covered. That's how quickly this whole mess spread. Now we see Tails with Tangle and Whisper. Long and short of it, Tangle and Whisper tell Tails to get to work on the virus. They're going to handle things outside. And we see Tails doing his best to remain undetected in his workshop, which might be hard if all of his machines are making all these beepy noises, as one of them is as Sonic gives him a call, and Sonic tells him he's right outside of Barricade Town, just checking in, with Tails telling him that the data from the Bioscanner, you know, that Fitbit Tails gave him so they could track his biometrics to see if there's any connection between Sonic's speed and a cure for the virus. He says that that information is coming through to Tails' workshop perfectly, so he has everything he needs to get to work on a cure on his end of things. He just has to remain, again, undetected by the Zombots. Tails also reminds Sonic that regardless of what Eggman is doing, he needs that speed data. That ultimately is going to be the key to stop whatever else Eggman is doing. If they can find a cure for the virus, they can stop whatever other attack he's coming up with. And as Tails hangs up with Sonic, he's startled by a crash as the Zombot tumbles over some trash outside. Then he then calls Amy to see how she's doing with Restoration HQ. And long and short of it, Amy is checking in to see if they need to send over any shuttles. Tails isn't sure, so he's going to check in with Tangle and Whisper to see what kind of resources they might need from Restoration HQ. Then we come back to the duo having some fun creative action against the Zombots. Always a fun time to see. And yeah, as we already know from the chaotic end of things, this is going to be where they send everybody down to the docks. All that fun stuff. We don't need to focus on that. The main story we have to focus on is Tails and how he is going to come up with a cure. And showing off Tails' brilliance, he flips over to a hologram that shows basically what we saw when Eggman first showed off the Metal Virus. Tails has kind of figured it out. He understands the basic structure, explaining that it looks and acts like a real live virus. Speaking out loud so the reader understands what he's thinking and, you know, maybe this is just how he problem solves, just talking out loud. He points out that he knows Sonic's speed deteriorates the virus structure. And how does he apply that to everything else happening here? They can't risk a vaccine that's too weak or only partially effective. They got to get this right on the first go. And to test out some more experiments, he's gonna need a bit of the virus itself. So he takes a power glove and heads on outside again trying to remain undetected by Zombots. He freezes for a second as Flickies fly overhead, but thankfully they don't notice him. He grabs a sample of the stuff and gives himself a nice cheer as we see a couple of chow over the horizon of his face-shaped workshop. The comic then cuts over to Zeti Castle, which you might recall from Sonic Lost World. And this is here to help establish these characters as even if you are familiar with who they are from that game, this is the first time they've appeared in the comic comics and they are going to be very important to the third act of this story. As you might recall, Starline dug up some information about the whole Lost World situation and has decided that he is going to meet with the Zeti to concoct a plan to control the Zombots as we know that the more the virus spreads, the less control Eggman has over the entire thing and Starline is doing his best to circumvent any future issues by using these guys who can control robots. Now if you might remember, everything kind of went to shit in Lost World between 
happened to Zeddy, Eggman, and Sonic. So this is a tense moment for Starline, but he tries to muster up as much bravado as possible. He says that this is an opportunity to make amends with Eggman, command incredible power, and destroy Sonic the Hedgehog. And Zavok, the big red Bowser dude right here, is surprisingly agreeable with this plan of action. If you're familiar with the Sonic franchise at all, you already know that Starline and all of the Zeddy are all garbage trash creatures. So this polite garbage is clearly just a ruse for the other. And yeah, as soon as both of them part ways, they both start talking trash about the other behind their back. With Zavok explaining that, yeah, no, we're, we're gonna capitalize on their foolishness. We're gonna basically take over the world. And Starline's basically gonna say the same thing at the end of this issue. So let's not waste our time there. They're both planning to double cross each other. No, no shocker there. We then spend a little more time with Tangle and Whisper, again, attacking some more Zombots, having a good time. We don't need to focus on that. Go read the comic for yourself if you want to see this stuff. It's a lot of fun. All this action is here is just to show that the rest of the cast outside of Sonic are hard at work to combat the virus however they can. And also a quick little note here, just in case fans would ask, because you know they would ask. Turns out the Wisps are immune to the virus since they are made of pure energy. We also see Silver in action by himself over in some isolated ice world. So that explains where he is during all of this craziness. We're not going to spend a lot of time talking about any of this stuff because again this is not super important what is important is that while all of this is happening it looks like tails has come up with a cure he says that by applying sonic's biometric data to a fresh sample of the virus he grabbed outside he can apply the data in real time to test models for immunization and even reversal of connotation basically he's saying that he combined data of sonic speed with the virus and i guess it came up with a cure they don't really go into any further detail than that we don't actually know why Sonic Speed is combating this stuff. Long and short of it, Tails has figured it out. He says he's just going to go upload it to the server at Restoration HQ. He's going to head on out to meet up with Tangle and Whisper. But an alarm goes off, and it turns out that the two metal virus up Chow are wrecking up his wires, meaning he won't be able to upload the data. But Tails, being the smart boy he is, doesn't panic. He's instead just going to grab the server blade and plug it in manually to Restoration HQ. There's still a chance to get this all set up so they can cure the world. But unfortunately, at the same time, a Zombot crashes through, startles Tails, who then drops the blade, destroying the data. Tails, looking defeated, runs on over to one of those zipline things. I love that they brought those in from the games. Oh, and he does a spin dash. Like, this is a really dark moment, but I love these little game details here. And we're not done with it yet, because he brings out his walker from Sonic Adventure 2. And Tails is gonna go hard. With tears in his eyes and fury in his face, he quietly whispers to himself, I had it. I was so close, and I can't blame you. He understands that they are victims, but man, I gotta tell you, if that was Eggman right in front of him, I would be worried, because we know how hard Tails goes when he is pissed in that mech. Nothing can stop him. And yeah, we see Tails bust on out of his workshop, combating the Zombots as best as he can. And yeah, this just had to be a great little moment for Sonic Adventure 2 fans, even though this is a miserable time for the entire cast here. And yeah, look at Tails. She is just geeking out there. She's just fangirling it up. Who can blame her? Man, it's good to see that stupid robot again, as much as I hate playing it. Yeah, long and short of it, all that really matters at this point is to get the rest of the survivors over to the shuttle. And while we don't have any casualties of the cast, we have a casualty all the same. Because just as we got to geek out over the return of his walker, the Zombots tear it apart. And you know your boy Tails loves his machines. The tear rolls down his face, thanking it for all of its hard work, saying it deserved better. And I'm sure a lot of SA2 fans have been feeling that way for quite a long time. But those tears only last for a panel as Tails gets a dope action shot flying away from his exploding walker. Oh, man. And just bringing in the SA2 walker is sign enough that even if you're mad about what happened with Shadow, this is still a reminder to the readers that, yo, we know, we get it, we love these characters too. We're not drawing the Tales from Sonic Forces. This is Tales from Sonic Adventure 2. This is a hero. And despite everything that just happened, he doesn't give up like a bitch. So, yeah. <laughs> Everything sucks. They literally had the cure in hand. But man, it was good to see Tails go off. He flies on up to the shuttle that's already taken off and catches up with Amy. And Tails is a little confused. Where are the other shuttles? Didn't have that many survivors, but Amy interrupts him. We're on the only one that made it out. 
Tales is like, what, what are you saying? Well, got some more bad news. Turns out Restoration HQ has fallen, and almost everyone with it. And now we're gonna dial back the clock and figure out exactly how that happened. As the next issue follows Amy and the Restoration HQ as everything was going on. And we kick things off with Amy explaining that Sonic's running around getting data for Tails and Tails is doing the research at Central City. Silver's there, Vector's up, still over there. It doesn't, doesn't matter. They're catching people up if you have just spent a month away. We have not, so let's keep going. Long and short of it, Amy is trying her best to allocate the resources and heroes at her disposal to calm combat this insane virus and the poor girl is super overwhelmed. Then we have the cheerful cream hopping in saying it's break time and this is a wonderful interaction between these often overlooked characters. Amy asks cream how do you do it and cream responds adorably like it's my mother's recipe and she learned it from her mother she's like, Amy's like no, I, I mean like staying upbeat and sunny and well cream gets a little real here she says it, it isn't easy still can't sleep very well I dream of cheese and chocolate and what happened and with tears in her eyes, Cream says that, but she knows that her mother's afraid too, and she sees everyone hiding here is scared, and that fear spreads like the metal virus. So to combat that, she's gonna put the biggest smile on her face and share it with everyone. And it's corny, and it's cheesy, and it is so very, very important to have that kind of a mindset when you're in a dire situation like this. Cream is showing us yet again why the rest of Sonic's cast respects her as much as they do, even though she's just a little kid. Now we have a very sweet hug and they're all chatting and then Tails calls and interrupts everything because sounds like some crap is going down. But we again cut over to the Zeddy and this is where the reader meets the rest of the Deadly Six. And despite how much I despise their designs, you can kind of tell what these guys are all about with their design, which is kind of the point of the characters and also establish the aggressive leadership of Zavok as he explains to his team that hey we're taking up Starline's offer and then we're gonna double cross him and the green one I don't know her name sarcastically responds you know unless this is another trap and we're Eggman slaves again and Zavok not one for criticism raises his hand showing that he clearly beats the crap out of her and everybody else on his team real angry dude for having long turquoise fingernails you know what I mean but this is him saying that we're gonna take our revenge we're gonna get back at Sonic, Eggman, and the entire world below us, and we're just gonna wreck their shit. But again, that's the only page of those characters we're gonna get in this issue. It's just, again, here to tell us they're coming. Whether you like it or not, they're coming. We cut back to Amy and Cream, and I don't really know what happened with that Tails call. He looked very distressed, but I don't know, maybe I listened in the last issue. It doesn't really matter. Point is, Cream heads on back out to the survivors, and as we can see, they are in tight quarters. They are very cramped. They're very stressed out and everybody is miserable and to make things worse espio and vector come on in with an infected charmy in an item bubble with general trying to stop him and being a cold logical robot he points out that they brought in a zombok and he's a pathogenic threat to my little rabbit you gotta get him out of here and vector is showing his loyalty to his crew saying yo the chaotics do not abandon their own but vector i feel like you're being kind of a hypocrite after you made a car jail for somebody else back in Central City. But yes, basically he's just arguing with the robot on whether or not they should keep Charmy in there. And Cream jumps on in to intervene and tells General to calm down. And General just, I mean, he's gonna go along with it because he listens to Cream, but points out that this is illogical and self-destructive and this is a very, very stupid idea. Espio's reasoning is that Vector has a solid plan. They'll securely store Charmy in Tails' lab alongside Omega, and once Tails has found a cure, Charmy will be immediately accessible. That's not a good plan. I'm just, that's a horrible plan. That's just putting him in the front of the line. And if he gets out, the first people that are gonna be infected are the people working on the cure. This is a stupid, dumb, stupid, dumb plan. We then cut on over to some of the survivors who are chatting amongst each other. And there's a monkey that's all sweaty and in a blanket and you know he's infected. And we'll look at that by the end of the page, he's infected. Yeah, he just, he didn't want to be alone. So he thought he'd come in and just infect everybody. I hate people, you stupid. God, this makes me much angrier after 2020. Yeah, I don't know how he slipped on through without anybody noticing, but yeah, he immediately transitions over into a Zombot. And that's been a problem for me because it seems like the infection rate of these things is very, very inconsistent, but 
whatever. Point is, there's now a metal monkey, and everyone's freaking out about it. They start running all over the place. Gemeral immediately grabs Cream and gets her out of the way. And through all the rumbling and shaking, oh, would you look at that? Charmy breaks out. Oh, goody, goody. Full of great ideas happening. God, this is... Everyone's stupid. Espio sets off the alarm, and Amy runs over to the radio and tells the pilots to prep for shuttles. They're gonna be taken off immediately. Restoration HQ's been compromised. It's time to bail. Just then, Gemeral is pushed through the door with the angry metal monkey on top, and Amy kindly responds with a hammer to its stupid monkey face. Amy sets Gemeral off with some orders to save who they can, get the priorities in order, and then jumps into the middle of all the Zombots and starts wailing on them. This girl is hard. Hardcore. She's trying to find Cream, who was flying overhead, watching her mother get infected by the Zombots, while she begs Amy to get her little girl to safety. And Amy does just that. She launches herself up with her Pico Hammer, and I love that they bring that element in from the games. I actually kind of miss that thing. And gets Cream out of there as she no longer can save her mother, and she's just gonna get infected herself. Vanilla says thank you weakly as Cream screams for her mother. As Amy keeps Cream on hold so she doesn't rush back in. General and Vector begin to close the doors on the Zombots. Man, that poor girl's been through a lot. Amy guides her over to the shuttle, and she asks where the other pilots are. Well, it turns out only one of them made it out of all the chaos. But hey, they got some survivors out. This is pretty rough, but the worst of it is over. Or so we think. General gives one last scan inside the room to make sure that there are no survivors in there, and confirms that everybody left in there is infected to some degree. So, unfortunately, they're just gonna have to lock it up. But before they do, Charmy, ever the troublemaker, flies on out, leaving Vector no choice but to pin him down. And, unfortunately, the virus begins to spread to Vector. General is barely holding back the Zombot horde, saying that Vector is compromised, immediate quarantine is required. <laughs> Vector, like a boss, just shoves General aside, holding Charmy under his arm, saying, yeah, I guess this is what I get. I'll beat him back just close the door behind me and then turns around with a wink in the middle of a zombot horde infected himself saying hey espio you're lead detective now and the doors shut close our gator boy having the coolest send-off of everybody so far. Sorry, Shadow. Our heroes stand in stunned silence. Even Gemral is taken aback, but quickly reminds everybody that they've got to get going. Vector is very strong, and as a Zombot, it won't be long before he breaks down the door. Amy collects herself and then picks up Espio, and they take off. And that is where we meet up with Tails yet again. Their stories now converge, but now we get a little more information from there. Now that everybody is collecting Tails is finally allowed to freak out, justifiably so. Now that he has lost everything in Central City, and now he has just found out that Restoration HQ has fallen. Because even if the upload was incomplete, he still could have done something with that data in that lab. There is only one hope left, and that's if Sonic comes back with a data analyzer intact. They're at a rough spot, but they can figure something out as long as they have that data. And golly, wouldn't you know it, the next story takes place, finally, from the view of Sonic the Hedgehog, and I bet everything's just gonna go swimmingly, don't you think? Uh, uh... Again, we turn back the clock to that initial conversation between everyone, this time from the perspective of Sonic as he zips through some fields, asking how Tails is doing, saying he's right outside of Barricade Town, blah, 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 blah. We know this stuff. And I love that while they don't immediately say it, they've said it in past issues, you can see that Sonic is clearly worn out with rings under his eyes. He's uh, He's been going for quite a while to keep his own virus in check. And we return to Barricade Town, that spot where our two skunk boys first attacked whoa, all the way back in issue three. With a thunderstorm overcast and the barricade of Barricade Town toppled over, clearly things have uh, not gone great. We see a quick moment of doubt in the ever-confident Sonic the Hedgehog, who questions to himself if he should check for survivors. And then do what, smart guy? He can't carry them to safety, and he could potentially risk a hit on this data analyzer that Tails gave him, and questions what is right. Maybe saving one person or keep running to save everyone. That's an obvious answer, Sonic. Just 
must keep running. None of this infection is going to matter as long as you keep running and get the data necessary to provide a cure, obviously. But while he stands there pondering, he notices a very familiar egg shape over the wall of Barricade Town. We then flip on over to the perspective of Dr. Starline and Eggman who are trying out different frequencies. As has been established already, Eggman has lost control over his Zombots, and as the virus spreads, they are less and less responsive. So, they're basically trying out different frequencies to see if they can rein them back in. And nothing seems to be working, and Eggman is not the type to sit around and just do boring things. Pointing out that he should have rigged an automated version of play from the face ship. And Starline, growing ever more frustrated by his hero, points out that wideband broadcast have had no effect. We agreed on a tight band localized attempt because this was the obvious next step. And Eggman responds, like, don't get a passive aggressive with me if you're gonna write my coattails. You better have my back. And Starline, through gritted teeth, all I'm saying, sir, is that in hindsight, it would have been smart to have a failsafe for the metal virus mutating beyond your control. And yeah, this is where we finally see a proper argument between these two characters. Starline's grown completely disillusioned with with the tactics of Eggman, who sees the mutations as his creations exceeding his own expectations, and says, hey, why don't we try that special gemstone of yours, which is the warp Topaz. And here we finally get a little more information on this magical gem that just casually dropped into this universe. Turns out that Starline found this warp Topaz a long time ago and explains some of its properties. He says that it responded strongly to even the most passive of energy waves. And in his early experiments, anything beyond a light controlled charge resulted in extreme reality alteration. Which is weird, that doesn't sound like teleportation, that sounds like phantom ruby nonsense, but who can keep any of this crap in check anyway? I, whatever. Point is, as he points out, that this can be a useful tool when used properly. But what Eggman is proposing is incredibly dangerous, and again, as Starline points out, Eggman is anything but cautious. He's absolutely not going to hand over the warp topaz. And also points out that they get to be inoculated for the metal virus. <laughs> when Eggman response shows what you know there is no fantasy <laughs> Oh my god, I love this character. Starline doesn't know how to handle this. She's like, well, what, uh, 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 how are we going to be protected from the infection? Megan just says, well, we're just not going to touch Zombots, obviously. What if there was a spill on the face ship or a mishap in the field? Or if it mutates and becomes airborne? And Eggman's just like, I, I'm done with it. I'm bored with this conversation. Just shut up. Yeah, it's a lot of fun having another scientist here that will challenge Eggman in his chaotic ways. I love this interaction interaction. But before the fight can continue any further, it's interrupted by Sonic. Now, it's also important to note, while Eggman and Sonic technically have met before in this comic, this is the first time he's met him in his Eggman persona. Not like for their first time ever, they're using a lot of game canon here, but the only other time we've seen these two interact in this particular comic series was when Eggman was Mr. Tinker. But Flynn gets right back into the classic Eggman-Sonic back and forth, with Eggman talking shit, saying, <laughs> look who it is, patient zero. Have you enjoyed watching my unbeatable plan unfold? And Sonic's just like, he's not having it today, dude. He's tired and he's pissed off. He's like, you know what? I'm not, we're not doing this. We're not doing this today. I need you to tell me why the hell you're doing this, man. And again, Eggie just does not provide any kind of logic whatsoever. It's like, dog, I've been trying to take over the world for years. You know that. And Sonic's like, no, man. Like, why did you go back to this mad scientist shit? I mean, sure, <laughs> Dr. Fashion Disaster over there gave you back your memories. And I love that subtle little bit of art there showing Starlight mess with his collar. <laughs> but Sonic, desperate to reach out to any kind of kindness in Eggman's heart, wants to know why did he go back to his old ways? What was wrong with being like Mr. Tinker? And Eggman just simply says, that's not who I am. Sonic's like, well, why, why don't you just be like him? And Eggie's like, what do, you, what do you want me to be? A charitable goody two-shoes who fixes doorknobs and builds toys? And he looks back down at the city below him, saying, living on grateful smiles, listening to children's laughter day in and day out, making things people need and use and for a moment it looks like he might actually miss being a decent dude but quickly turns back saying yeah that was a relaxing life but i'm gonna do something better he's bringing peace and unity to the world by providing it with his brilliant guidance that's about as far as that particular conversation was gonna go and of course i have to jarnly shove in a bit of crush 40 lyrics with eggman saying we're not that different you and i we both have our own styles and we won't change i don't know if that would have read a little bit more naturally if i didn't hear that song
song a thousand times, but it, it was a little distracting for me. It, it's fine, and it's also on point. But Sonic's just, he's had enough of it. He's out of patience. He tells Eggman, you're gonna reverse this metal virus or else. And Egg is like, or else what? And Sonic's like, or I'll kick your ass or else what? And Egg's like, all right, dog, one last battle before you're a stupid ass zombie. Let's roll. So they go at it, classic Sonic and Eggman style. And we take this time to look at this from Starline's perspective. And it's a very interesting critique of the relationship between these longtime foes. Starline says that he's been dreaming of seeing this scene play out in front of him for as long as he could remember. But now that it is, all he can feel is apathy. He looks back on the plan of Neo Metal Sonic, who nearly succeeded in reviving the Eggman Empire. But Starline thought he acted far too brashly. Starline was under the impression that Neo only failed because he was designed to be a counter to Sonic, a ballistic missile with a built-in grudge. But now that he's looking at this, Neo Metal Sonic didn't fail because he was copying Sonic. He failed because he was copying Eggman. This is the exact same brute force strategy he's seen play out before. Basically, don't meet your heroes. Starline has completely lost faith in Eggman's ability to carry out this plan, and we will see how that plays out in just a little while. Going back to the perspective of Eggman and Sonic, they keep trying to talk shit to each other, with Eggman saying that you can't run forever, you're gonna be tired eventually, and then you're gonna turn into a Zombot. And Sonic's like, cool, if you love it so much, why don't you have some? <laughs> And Eggy completely freaks out and topples over his egg mobile and falls into the village below. <laughs> I love Sonic here. Sure, it'd be nice if you had a cure handy, huh? And Eggy's starting to freak out in front of his own creations. He panically screams, get back! And then all the Zombots completely ignore him and begin to attack Sonic. And Eggy is very confused, saying, did that work? We cut back to Starline up in the air, still looking pissed, saying, no, I just found an effective command symbol. And while he is frustrated, he does also point out that, well, maybe he doesn't need to roll out his other plan now that they have a frequent see that works. But if that's the case, what will Eggman learn from this? But Eggy cheers him on saying, excellent work. Now upload that frequency to the face ship so I can command the rest of the Zombots around the world. And Sonic, completely sworn by Zombots, freaks out. He knows he can't let that happen and blasts on through the horde and up through the Egg Mobile, destroying Eggman's ability to upload the frequency to control all the Zombots, but also destroying the data analyzer necessary for Tails to concoct a cure. Eggy and Starline fly on off, bickering the entire time. <laughs> Man, I just love these two. They are fantastic. Starline opens a portal back to the face ship and is still pretty pissed. Eggy, quite used to these failures, just says, whatever, who cares? Starline saying that with all the commotion, he didn't get to memorize the working frequency, but he does recall the range so they could start from there. But Eggman says, why, why bother? Starline understandably asks, excuse me? Me? And Eggman points out that it's too risky to use it at such a close range. Besides, the metal virus is most likely already adapting to resist it. And I'm not going to go through all of that again just for something that's not going to work. Which, to be fair, is sound reasoning. And Starline finally seems to agree, but follows up by asking, well, what are we going to do next? And then Eggman's basically like, I don't know, I'll think of something, don't worry about it. Well, with Starline's look on his face, you can tell uh, he's kind of made up his mind about enacting another plan. But we cut back over to Sonic, who has become much shinier since we last saw him. He is beyond exhausted and full of regret. As he sees Zombots begin to swarm around him, he finally notices that his data analyzer is destroyed, and his guilt overtakes him as the metal virus begins to as well. He wasn't able to protect the data analyzer. He hasn't been able to protect his friends. He put the faith in the idea that everyone has a little good in them, and Eggman has made him pay for it every day. As he turns, we see his eyes begin to turn red, but Sonic, being Sonic, is not about to give up and blasts on out of the town. We see flakes of the virus begin to shave off him as he once again shoots off through a field, seeing that he can't give up. He's got to find a way to protect his friends and keep him safe. He screwed up a lot, but he still has time to make things right. And again, we're seeing something we rarely ever see in Sonic media. He's run to the point of exhaustion. <laughs> I love this line. Like, he feels like he's going to collapse. Is this what everyone else feels? like after a run? And at this point, Amy makes contact with him, catches him up with everything that's been going on while he's been away. Restoration HQ has fallen, Tails' lab has been destroyed, and now they're on their way to Spiral Hill Village to help evacuate it. And poor exhausted Sonic says to himself, man oh man, I guess the good news is things officially can't get any worse.
So, now all of our characters are all caught up in their particular stories, and now we're going to carry on forward as Sonic arrives at Spiral Hill Village, saying that the first time he was here, it was under attack by Eggman, and it doesn't look like things have changed. The little hints of the metal virus on the surrounding vegetation shows us that it's already hit the town, and since we already covered that annual, we know that was the case as well. Sonic blasts on through some Zombots, noticing that Restoration HQ is already here. Here. And, uh, they all look a little, uh, well, cheerful isn't the right word. Probably every other word opposite of cheerful. That was That's probably the best way to describe how they're all looking right now. Sonic scopes the perimeter to see who needs help first and uh, takes a look at Espio and says, yeah, I probably could use a little bit of assistance. And as a Zombot horde begins to overwhelm Espio, Sonic comes in and saves the day. Once that's cleared, the two boys have a moment to catch up. Sonic joking, hey, you fighting the whole town by yourself? And Espio's like, well, our numbers have grown thin. And SPO basically lays out what all the other characters are doing to help get survivors out of this town. But as SPO goes through the list of folks, Sonic notices that he doesn't mention Vector. And that's where SPO catches Sonic up on that. Let him know that Vector got infected back at Restoration HQ and begins to blame himself, saying that he should never have let Vector bring Charmy back to Restoration. It's my fault. And Sonic tries to console him, saying, no man, you can't. But SPO snaps on Sonic, because he isn't blaming himself for Vector coming back with Charmy to Restoration HQ. He's blaming himself for letting Sonic convince him to leave Eggman in Windmill Village. Sonic responds saying that that was Mr. Tinker. There's no way to know that Starline would bring him back to his Eggman persona. And SPO responds, and if we had dealt with him then, we wouldn't have anything to worry about. Sonic quips back. So what? We have to assume the worst about everyone and everything? Show no mercy to anyone? No second chances? And the two just look at each other. This is not the time or the place for this particular debate. Espio is pissed as hell, but as he says, there are people to save. Sonic turns his back saying, yep, see you at the shuttle. Sonic gets back to work, taking down Zombots and containing them, and notices a little backup from Whisper the Wolf. Good to see you here. And they give each other a thumbs up. He then carries on over to finally catch up with Amy. And uh, if you'll notice here, a uh, few of the survivors are looking a little pissed at him. <laughs> I wonder why. They have their cute little back and forth, but long and short of it, Sonic just wants to know where he's needed. Amy basically, again, lays out what everybody else is doing, which we've already done. And Sonic summarizes it pretty shortly, so he's got to cover the escape out of the town. Gotcha. He's going to go find Tangle and see if she's got any ideas. This is her hometown after all. So she's obviously the first person to talk to about routes for evacuation, stuff of that nature. But before he goes, Tails and Cream catch up to him. Tails, desperate for any kind of hope, asks Sonic if he still has the data recorder stashed somewhere. And Sonic then tells him what happened with Eggman. The data analyzer is destroyed. And Tails, trying his best to hold back tears, says it's fine. Without his lab or the headquarters, he wouldn't have been able to synthesize a vaccine anyway. So our heroes are uh, about as hopeless as they've been so far in this story. But we're not done here. Amy, exhausted, does her best to tell Tails to focus on the now. And Tails says, it's, it's whatever, we couldn't find anybody else anyway. Everyone's become Zombots. We see a little more Amy die on the inside. Well, then it's time to go. Signal the retreat, we gotta get out of here. And Sonic gets back to his original plan. He's gonna at least find Tangle and coordinate with her. Tails is gonna go off and find SPO and Whisper. And as the boys rush off, General approaches Amy, who says, Amy Rose, I performed a scan on Sonic. And Amy just, <laughs> poor girl, exhausted. He says, yeah, I know he's infected. We've known that for a minute. And he says, correct. However, he's run calculations on the level of infection he's exhibiting and it's higher than the previous estimates should allow. Amy's just had it. She's like, what are you getting at, man? And General reveals that Sonic's speed is losing its ability to hold back his own virus. So even if Sonic could miraculously stay awake forever, the virus is mutating to a point where even his speed is not going to matter for much longer. And uh, ugh. now we get over to Tangle because, you know, we really, we really need a little bright bit of sunshine at this point and you can't do much better than her. And she's cleverly holding back Zombots by using little stools to protect her feet from infection. I don't know why the soles of her shoes can't do that, but whatever, doesn't matter. So yeah, she's just talking shit 
shit until Sonic finally arrives and asks her, hey, anyone need a rescue? And Tangle says, nah, I'm fine. Sonic informs her that Amy's calling for a retreat, but the minute we stop causing a ruckus in town, and Tangle finishes the sentence, the Zombots will head for the big, noisy shuttle. Not good. But Restoration's managed to cover just about every avenue, except for this one. Sonic asks her, does she have any ideas on how to plug this particular bottleneck? And Tangle, ever the Optimus, says, yeah, sure do. Step one, you pick me up. Step two, I wrap my tail around one of the lampposts. Step three, you wind us between the lampposts, and I use my tail as a tripwire. <laughs> look how she's drawn here. I love how expressive this is. God, look at this art. This is amazing. And Sonic points out the one and only flaw of this plan. If they do that, she'll get infected. But Tangle, hey, she ain't worried about it. She says, already got it covered. She went and checked on Jewel the instant she arrived in town. And she was already infected and got the jump on her. And casually points out that she's been infected. And she really doesn't have a whole lot longer. And Sonic just apologizes to her. Tangle says, why? It's not your fault. Sonic's like, isn't it? If I just listened to Shadow or SPO, or if I hadn't let Metal Sonic go. But Tangle interrupts him by punching a Zombot with her tail and says that you didn't bring Eggman back. That was Starline. You made sure Metal was harmless. Eggman weaponized him again. Sonic says, yeah, and I haven't been able to protect my friends or anybody. Tangle says, yeah, and nobody's guarding that shuttle full of nothing. And Sonic responds, <laughs> you're not going to let this thing get to you, are you? And she has a triumphant never because you're sonic the hedgehog you'll set this right i know you will now less moping and more moving so with that he picks up tangle she grabs a lamppost and they crisscross between a whole set of them to create a tripwire. And Tangle says that should be enough to at least get the shuttle out of there. And says, tell the others I'm sorry. Especially Whisper. Sonic says, thanks for everything. And they give one last hug. And something we've never seen from this character before, a tear rolls down Tangle's face and then turns her face before Sonic can see, saying, hey, get a move on. Told you I got this. And Sonic, understanding, turns his back to leave it to Tangle, who then wipes away that tear and gets back to fighting Zombots. Sonic catches up with the rest of Restoration HQ, saying, let's get going. I'll ride on the outside. And Amy asks, where's Tangle? Sonic says she got infected. She's staying behind to cover all of us. She said she was sorry, but heroes have nothing to be sorry about. And while we will pick that particular line apart later, the more important takeaway for the rest of the crew is that Tangle's infected. And we see the reactions of Amy, Cream, Tails, Espio, and Whisper. And our quiet little wolf completely breaks down. And again, we all know this is all going to wrap up just fine. Good guys will win in the end. There's no actual violence or death. It's a kid's story, but it's moments like this that really hit you to your core, where you see these fun, cartoony, colorful characters react in the most human way possible to pain and loss. And the grief of Whisper is so severe that her namesake no longer applies. Her closed eyes are wide open with tears flooding freely, her mouth agape with her fangs bared, screaming for her friend. Let's give it up for the art here again, because the emotion is so raw. She stops looking like any other cartoon character. She looks almost animalistic in her pain. And after everything we've seen between those two characters and the relationship form, especially with a miniseries, this, this one is really hard. Amy tries her best to hold Whisper back, telling Sonic to help, and he can't. He can't touch anybody, he can't do anything. And that's when Whisper's wisps come shooting out of her wispin and drag her onto the shuttle. I gotta tell you, 10 years ago playing Sonic Colors, I never would once think that one of the most emotionally raw moments of the Sonic franchise would contain the wisps. It's, um... Man, this is rough. They drag her on board with Amy giving one last command to get out of there and Sonic silently jumps on afterwards. We cut back to the perspective of Tangle who is still holding on as long as she can. She gives a little smirk and says, don't keep me waiting too long and then gets right back to it by punching Zombots in the face and the virus begins to creep up her tail and right onto her booty. <laughs> She's like, oh, that's unpleasant. And she looks onto the horde. Even though the virus still spreads, she says that she She's still standing, still fighting, still. And as she throws out one last punch, it falls short just an inch before a Zombot's face. And Tangle finally has turned, joining the rest of the mindless Zombot horde that were once her neighbors. And Sonic just looks on. And Cream, despite losing everything, despite being dead on the inside, holds a grieving, crying whisper as the most optimistic, cheerful member of the IDW Sonic crew has fallen. 
So, yep, through all four of these issues, you keep feeling like it just can't get worse, but then it's one emotional gut punch after the other, and it all happens at the same time. We had to wait month after month to watch all of this happen, but all of these losses happened to Sonic and his friends all in one fell swoop, and we're not done just yet. As we cut back to Starline and Eggman. Starline says, Doctor, I have found a solution to the ongoing problem of not being able to control the Zombots. And Eggman says, I told you I would figure something out. Stop pestering me. And with that final dismissive comment, we see Starline's resolution to enact his own plan and activates the Warp Topaz to bring in the worst ska band to ever hit the world. That's right, kids. The characters that nobody ever wanted to see again have finally returned. We're just about at the finish line, folks, but we have another crazy set of events to cover before we wrap up this story. And things kick off with issue 25, and I gotta tell you, it's so crazy seeing another Sonic comic reach the coveted 25 issue mark. That was such a big deal for me as a kid with the original Archie series, but that's a topic for another time. We start off the story with a character we have not yet seen once during this entire storyline, and that's Knuckles the Echidna, standing guard next to the Master Emerald as per usual and he looks up in the sky to see a restoration shuttle and Sonic drops in front of him and he is not looking good. <laughs> Goodness gracious. Yeah, his virus has almost completely overtaken his body, as all that's left is just half of his face and a little bit of his chest, which is a little inconsistent if you remember that comic way back where we saw somebody turn before they were even finished being covered, but whatever, that might be more artistic interpretation than anything else. This is an awesome piece of artwork. <laughs> I love Knuckles. Why do you look like Metal Sonic? Sonic waves him off, this is a long story, stay back, I don't want to touch the grass. <laughs> <laughs> Knuckles, what's wrong with my grass? Look, I gotta go on a run, don't worry about it. The other two will explain it for you. It's been like many, many issues about this shit. Just, just talk to them. <laughs> Love Amy's face as she comes to land. Yeah, Knuckles is giving them a look. Usually trouble shows up whenever Sonic does, so he's gonna be in for one hell of a story. But then we shift perspectives back to Eggman and Starline. And if you remember from the end of the last video, the platypus has brought the deadly six aboard the face ship. Eggy is pissed and immediately sends Metal Sonic out to take out the deadly six. <laughs> Destroy for daddy! <laughs> But if you recall how they operate in the games, you know this is not going to go well. Zavok immediately takes control of Metal Sonic and then condescendingly lets the reader and Eggman know, uh, don't you remember? This is, this is kind of our whole shtick. And Starline backs him up, which is precisely why I brought you here. You six will keep the Zombots under control while Eggman researches a better way to contain the Metal Virus. So Starline believes he's doing Eggman a favor. He's making up for his lack of foresight with, and then, excuse me, blows into the conch to get the deadly six back in line but unfortunately they are very familiar with this thing and they are ready to go on the attack as the purple one i forgot what his name is headbutt starline and it just oh man it looks so brutal then green grabs it from him i'm not going to pretend like i remember their names i don't care so yeah we are three pages into this comic and immediately the deadly six have taken over the entire situation but before we leave this scene they shift their focus over to Orbot and Cubot, who take a look at a screen that just appeared before them. A screen with a somewhat familiar looking icon. I wonder who could that be? But shifting back over to the focus of Eggman and Starline, who is very confused about what just happened, is quickly informed by Eggman, the conch only works as long as your lungs last. And I love this because it shows Starline is not above Eggman's own failings. He is very arrogant, very full of himself, which is the exact same thing. Thing, and that blinds him to his own shortcomings. And Eggy, despite being a chaotic mess of a man, still knows what he's doing. That doesn't mean he isn't above his own shortcomings, but there are reasons why he would not recruit the Deadly Six. There are reasons why he does not revisit plans after they fail. He is, at the end of the day, a smart man, with a lot of failings and a lot of shortcomings, but he is a consistent threat for a reason. But unfortunately, there is an even bigger threat in Zavok and the rest of the Six. As he said, sends Metal Sonic back on his creator to attack Starline and Eggman. Starline opens a portal, Metal chases after them, and they all transport
teleport out of the face ship, leaving the deadly six alone with the entire ship and all seven Chaos Emeralds. Now, I know a lot of us are not the biggest fans of the deadly six, and I'll get into more critique about their use in this comic, but just generally as a Sonic fan, even if I can't remember all of their names off the top of my head, I still recognize these characters and I still love seeing parts of this franchise come together. The Deadly Six were so isolated from everything else that had happened in Sonic's world because they were literally on a different continent, floating in the sky. So it was cool to see Metal and Zavok have that quick interaction, and it's even cooler to see these characters interact with the coveted Chaos Emeralds, as Zavok takes the purple one and attaches it to his chest, saying, like all things, we take their power as our own. Yeah, get ready kids, for the first time ever, we're going to see the Deadly Six be a legitimate threat. Orbot and Cubot just start simping for Zavok immediately, saying bravo, A plus plan, new boss. And Orby quickly takes QB aside and tells him, look, I'm kind of saving our hides here. Let's just play kiss ass now, otherwise he's just going to take control of us. And the plan works. Zavok says you're going to serve me freely. And Orbot's like, yeah, of course, man, I'm spineless, both, li <laughs> both literally and figuratively. <laughs> Now, that's kind of a, just a hand-wavy motion. I really don't know why Zavok would not just put them under his control anyway, just to be on the safe side. This is still a robot programmed by Eggman, but maybe it expends too much of his energy, even though he's got a Chaos Emerald on him now. I don't know. We're going to move on past it. Point is, Orbot is clearly working with Rouge the Bat, who makes her return to the comic. She's clearly made her way aboard the face ship and is watching from the rafters. Zavok, at this point, takes the rest of the Chaos Emeralds and hands it off to his commanders, sending each of them off to different parts of the world to take command of the Zombots. His plan is to organize all of them and send them off to do his bidding, and once every living thing has been infected, neither Eggman nor Sonic will have anywhere left to run. They are just going to remove any hiding spot those two have. They're going to go this far for their revenge. We finally shift our focus back to Angel Island, where Knuckles has clearly been caught up with everything that's been going on with the surface below. <laughs> He's not having a good time. And it's about to get worse, as it turns out that Starline has sent Eggy and Metal and himself to Angel Island. <laughs> And if you recall, everyone's been through a nightmarish mess, and so far, Sonic is the only one of the heroes that has made direct contact with Eggy. This is the first time the rest of the cast has seen the villain who's responsible for everything going on, and Amy is pissed. But Sonic tells her to chill out, saying that Eggman has had every advantage. So why would he come to us without his army, or his Egg Mobile, or anything? Well, I mean, he's got Metal Sonic there, so I, I mean, there, there's something there. And uh, again, I don't really know if I like Sonic taking the role of everything, be it leader, tactician, everything else. I like him being a little more reactionary, but this is this interpretation of Sonic. And again, we'll save that analysis for a little later. Point is, he knows there's something way off with what's going on with the Zombots, and Eggy needs to start explaining himself. Otherwise, Sonic will infect him himself. He quickly says that idiot boy over here brought the deadly six to the face ship, and they've taken over everything. Knuckles asks the obvious question, why should we trust them, and Espio is there to respond. He just got word from Rouge, who will, of course, corroborate Eggy's story. So, they all reconvene inside the shuttle. And I love everything happening in this first panel here. We have Starline being watched by both Espio and Knuckles. Gemral is facing down with metal, which is rad. Nothing we've ever seen before. This is what I'm talking about. I love seeing these little bits and pieces of Sonic history come together. And this sheep girl, who we've seen time and time again, looks very terrified of Sonic, who is just sitting right above her. And considering she's looked pissed off every time we've seen her prior to this point, I'm sure she's gonna be a pain in the ass for our heroes somewhere down the line. Just calling it right now, she hasn't made a peep, but these are very expressive pieces of art. But back to the topic at hand, Rouge is playing the spy here, giving our heroes information about what's happening aboard the phase ship, Zavik's battle plan, things of that nature. Tails is pissed, and this shows just how different these two characters are in terms of their intelligence and their view on science. Tails found a cure for the metal virus. He sorted it out, but he's not worried about his own brilliance. He's not worried about his own accomplishments. All he cares about is saving people. And he tells Eggy to give us a cure for
for the metal virus. He's not worried about how he stacks up to Eggman in terms of intelligence. He just sees somebody who has a means to solve this issue where he's fallen short and he wants a cure now. And actually, amazingly, in this tiny panel, this is understated, but this is very important. Eggman says that he has not come up with a cure for the metal virus. Now, it could just be because he didn't feel like it, but this is something Tails has managed to accomplish and he didn't have Eggman's notes. He had to sort it out all by himself. But while I would love to appreciate how much love Tails is getting in this comic, we do have to focus on the more important problem that was the metal virus. As Eggman says that his research has found that the metal virus mutates and it becomes unsustainable. And basically explains in science jargon that eventually the infected are going to disintegrate. They'll take about 200 years, but he'll have evacuated to a different world by then, so he's not worried about it. And this is where Silver comes in to confirm this. Because in his timeline, all that was left was ruins, metallic plants. This is why his future looks the way it does. It's because the metal virus will eventually take over every living thing, and eventually they will disintegrate. That's why nobody was left in his timeline. And Silver's obviously looking worse for wear. If you remember, he was, which I originally assumed was on his own, over at Ice Paradise. But turns out he had a whole crew there, a shuttle and everything, and well, Zombots took it down and he couldn't save anybody. And now he's feeling a lot of guilt. He's worried that his failures here is why his future looks the way it does. <laughs> Just love Eggy. <laughs> Just responds to us like, is he always this melodramatic? But as you can see, we are looking at him through a sniper scope, which is then blocked off by a rather adorable forehead. As it turns out, Whisper was pointing her wispin right at the face of Eggman. <laughs> Wasn't that a lovely callback to Fleetway Sonic, huh? Yeah, as you can imagine, Whisper is pretty pissed with Eggman. But Cream, as always, jumps in and asks for the route of non-violence. Whisper tells her to move, and Cream tells her, I understand why you hate him. I, I really do. But we need him, whether you like it or not. He's a means to stop this entire mess, and regardless of how upset she is with him, ultimately, what matters to her is seeing her mother again, and her chows, and everybody else. And you know, I've given her some slack for being a bit too lenient here or there there, but I gotta give it up for this little girl. Despite all of her pain, she's seen through this as reasonably as possible. What matters more than however they're feeling in the moment is saving the people they love. And Whisper pulls her little mask back, and with a dribbly face, it's obvious, as painful as it is, she agrees. So it's another touching moment between Cream and another one of these characters. And I love that Omega's there the whole time just talking shit to Eggman. He's like, you can't kill him, I gotta kill him. I love that Cream's just like, thank you, we'll stay with you so you won't be lonely. <laughs> Omega. <laughs> I'm not lonely. I am enraged. We cut back to the rest of the crew. There's been a makeshift treadmill for Sonic to run on so he doesn't get infected, and everyone comes together to make a plan to tackle the Deadly Six. Starline suggests that they implement the Master Emerald, as that could potentially neutralize the Deadly Six. And Tails says we can't move it without risking the whole island, and we certainly can't lure them here. It's too much of a risk. And of course, Knuckles also chimes in saying, you're not touching it. Espio comes up with Chaos Control. Silver says that Shadow was much better at it than he was, and it only moves a target over a limited range. Can't change things. And Amy suggests, well, maybe if Sonic was transformed into Super Sonic. And Sonic responds, I don't think so. Super Sonic means the Chaos Emeralds give me unlimited power, but that doesn't mean I can just do anything with it. We'll get back to that. And Eggy also points out that all the Emeralds have been scattered to the winds because the Deadly Six are now dotted all over the planet. <laughs> Eggy's response, I was waiting for all of you to exhaust your bad idea. Ideas. It's actually simple. We're going to use the warp topaz. And he goes back to what Starline told him about it. Yes, as dismissive as Eggy was of Starline, again, he's a very smart guy and he is always scheming. He was paying very close attention to what Starline was telling him. And he points out that the topaz can cause massive changes with just a little charge. And if you pump the power of supersonic through it, he could warp the virus away in one fell swoop. Now, I don't exactly know how all of that works works together, especially since we were just told that Supersonic can't just let you do anything. And we also know that the virus changes you on a cellular level. And I know that Supersonic's managed to do other things. We'll get to it. Point is, that's the battle plan they're going to go with. But the next step is figuring out how to track down all the Chaos Emeralds and bring them back to this point. But unfortunately, Starline does not agree. As he's pointed out plenty before, the Warp Topaz is a very dangerous little gem. As the only expert 
on the Warp Topaz, he states that Eggy is being excessively reckless, and he's proven that to be the case this entire time. Starline gives us a little bit more information here, saying that creating and directing warp portals is difficult, and the components of his glove were built after countless hours of careful testing. Supersonic using the Warp Topaz recklessly could undo the virus, or it could warp space-time so badly that the entire planet collapses. Here on Angel Island, they have a safe haven. They have resources. They can put in the work and find a safe, responsible way to regain control of the situation. Which I agree with with Starline, but then he ends with, we can still win. So no, he still wants to take over the entire planet with the virus. And Eggy points out that Sonic is on borrowed time. It's not going to be safe forever. And he'll take any risk to ensure that the Zeti don't use his own genius against him. You don't have any better option. We're ending this. But Starline has had enough and says, no, I will figure out a way to finish what you started. And you can thank me later. And begins to open a warp portal. But as quick as those portals are, they are not as quick as Metal Sonic, who rushes up behind Starline and grabs his arm. God, this art is so brutal without showing any actual violence. Damn. Eggman snatches the gauntlet off of Starline's battered hand. I like that little detail. It shows he's actually done a lot of experimenting with this stuff. Damn. I never noticed that detail before. But yes, at this point, Eggman has had enough of Starline and says, you're fired. And with that, Metal sends him into the now open portal and it closes behind him. Damn. And Tails just confirms with Sonic that they're not going to move on Eggy after that altercation. Starline's a dick. We're not going to worry about it. And basically the rest of the plan is formed from here. With the warp topaz, they're going to build a multi-portal generator. And with Rujan Orbot's counterintelligence, they can find the exact locations of all of the Zeti. From there, they're going to split up into teams of two, except for Espio, and retrieve the emeralds. But unfortunately, their numbers are running a little low, so Amy has to call in reinforcements. And those reinforcements come in the form of the Babylon Rogues. <laughs> Now, if you have not read the first annual and you're not super familiar with Sonic the Hedgehog, you might not know who the hell they are, so you just kind of have to go forward just accepting that these characters are now here. Again, if you're familiar with the franchise, it's not a big deal. This is kind of an interesting way to bring them back into the fold, as this is technically their very first appearance in the mainline book. And Amy also points out that, I mean, they are thieves. They'd be perfect for stealing Chaos Emeralds. And I do love that Jet is just being a little shit when he sees Sonic. <laughs> Sonic the Hedgehog, you're looking more pathetic than ever. The song's like, yeah, charming, are you gonna help us or what? And Sonic plays into Jet's arrogance, saying that we need the help of the legendary Windmaster, which is kind of telling him that I accept that you're better than me with your stupid wind skateboard, whatever. And that is enough for Jet to agree to help. And I do love that Amy says that, don't worry, I won't tell Knuckles. Sonic has a lot of rivals out there and he's exhausted. His ego's been taking a beating for a while. He's, he's fine with it. We then spend a little time with each of the six as we see their reign of destruction between all the different cities they are invading. The fat yellow one's demanding more food, the one on the moon thing's just causing chaos, that weird emo one is on the back of that stupid owl from Lost World and is just enjoying all the misery taking place before him. The green one, which I guess is named Xena, I will forget that again, is just having the Zombots carry her through the town, picking up different accoutrements and stuff of that nature. Now what's interesting for this one is that the Zombots are indeed under their complete control as we see other civilians completely unaffected and completely ignored by the Zombots. So clearly the Six have complete control and for some reason they are still using the threat of the Zombot infection on the civilians. Just shows how cruel and terrible these characters are. They could just turn them immediately and just put them under their control or just make them suffer. Why not? And the Old One is sending off Zombots to do whatever. Basically the invasion is going very very well and soon they will be taking over the entire world as issue 25 ends on the zombotified silhouettes of all of the casts that we've lost so far as well as like a pig dude is his nose glowing does i know his eyes are is this, what's going on there now, the last set of heroes and Eggman and Metal Sonic have all converged onto Angel Island, their last safe haven as the world's been consumed by the Metal Virus and is now under control of the Deadly Six. And we kick things off with this episode with a very interesting and rarely seen team up. We've got Eggman and Tails working together on a project. As we already know, the Warp Topaz is a very unstable gem. Starline so far has been the only character that's been able to manage 
managed to carefully control the thing, but with the combined intelligence of Eggy and Tails here, they've managed to put together a multi-portal generator. With this up and running, the heroes are going to split up and take on the Deadly Six all at the same time and capture their Chaos Emeralds. Now, technically, there are more than enough characters here to take on the Deadly Six with two or maybe even three characters, but they aren't without their handicaps. Sonic, for instance, is not going to be able to join them as he has been just run ragged through this entire event. And Knuckles flat out refuses to join in because this is Angel Island and he's not going to leave Eggman and Metal Sonic alone on here. The only defense for the Master Emerald would be a worn out and infected Sonic the Hedgehog. And that's a problem because obviously Sonic is <laughs> a very important aspect for the team, especially since he's fought the Deadly Six before. And Knuckles is one of the biggest bruisers in the universe of Sonic the Hedgehog. So that's a massive handicap on their behalf. Still, Sonic knows his friend's abilities and he knows the abilities of the Deadly Six, so he helps split them up accordingly. And while I do love to joke that I don't know the names of the Deadly Six, I am still here to help guide you through these comic books, so it is only fair that I tell you who these characters are and why they're going to be so much fun in these fights. Thankfully, Ian Flynn also thought the same thing, as he uses Sonic to explain to the characters and in turn to the reader who these characters are and what their abilities entail. Sonic starts off saying that Tails and Amy are going to take on Zamom. He's a bruiser and, well, I mean, Tails has dealt with these guys before, and if you've played the video games, you already know that Tails and Amy are a powerhouse set of characters. Let's be real here, even with a Chaos Emerald, that big yellow dude doesn't have a chance against them. Espio is going to take on Zaz. He's the lanky purple one who's basically a berserker. Think of a kid-friendly carnage. Silver and Whisper are going to take on Zor, the emo flavor. His thinking is they have abilities that can let them attack from a distance, and that's the best way to take on this guy. And that, unfortunately, leaves the most confusing pair-up I've seen so far, because Gemral is going to be taking on Xena alone. Xena is the green girl of the Deadly Six. And if you recall, the Deadly Six are here to begin with because they can control machines and robots. So Sonic sending out Gemral to take her on himself is a very confusing move, to say the least. Whisper is used to working by herself, and she should be able to take on even a Chaos Emerald fueled emo kid. That shouldn't be an issue. And Silver, or for God's sakes, he's about as OP as it gets in this universe. But whatever, it's for story purposes, and it's one hell of an intense fight. So we'll deal with that in a second. The last setup here is actually going to be between Master Zick, the tiny old man guy, and the Babylon Rogues. Now, again, three on one might not be the most fair in terms of a setup here, especially when you have one robot that's supposed to take on one of these guys. But I do think it makes sense to have Jet and his crew work together together. It's not like they're used to working with any of these other characters, so might as well keep them together and coordinated as a team, especially against Zick, who is a very crafty dude. But before they all go off to take on their particular flavor of Zeddy, we have Amy and Rouge discussing things. While Zavik doesn't know where the heroes are, he isn't an idiot, and he's using all the resources at his disposal on the spaceship to figure out where Eggman is, including getting a detailed list of all the places he's had bases before, both on and off world. And this is actually another little bit of world building here because he sees the name Angel Island listed and he has no idea what that place is, which is kind of cool because again, we've never had these characters really and truly interact in the games. So this is the first time the Zeddy really interact with a lot of these iconic elements of the Sonic universe. And that's really cool. How can it is, I don't know, but it's nice to see this actually take place here in the comic book. Now, Orbot and Cubot do their best to distract him in the meantime but he is at least aware of it on the list of places where Eggman's had bases before. So it is really only a matter of time before he makes his way over there. And switching our focus over to Knuckles and Espio, and it really is only two panels, but this is still a really cool moment for me as someone who really loved Knuckles' Chaotix, and despite the problems I do have with the Archie book and the way Penders wrote those particular characters, I still always felt like Knuckles and the rest of the Chaotix should have more of a brotherhood, considering the entire Knuckles Chaotix video game, you know? But unfortunately, in the last couple decades, they really haven't had a whole lot of interaction with each other. But here in two panels, we get Knuckles and Espio chatting with each other, and we do get a little more to Knuckles as a character. We already know that he's the guardian of Angel Island and the Master Emerald, and he's very, very protective of both of those things, but he also has a huge heart, as we see them walking through the campsite of the survivors from the surface below. And Espio is worried about what's going to happen to them if they fail. And Knuckles reassures him that regardless of what
whatever else happens. If worse comes to worse, he's gonna watch over these people. And again, this is more characterization than Knuckles has gotten the last decade or so in the video games. And despite whatever else you want to say, this is showing growth of his character because the Knuckles, prior to meeting Sonic and all of his friends, would probably never allow anything like this. And yeah, it kind of sucks that we finally get Knuckles in this storyline and the first thing he does is say, nope, I'm not gonna do anything. This quiet little moment does mean a lot for me as a longtime Knuckles fan, but I've gone on about it for far too long. We've got a lot left to cover. The last interaction here is probably the most memorable for a lot of people who read through this story. As we see Eggman tweaking the portal generator and we see Metal Sonic standing at attention next to Sonic on a treadmill. And this is an interaction we don't really get anywhere besides comic books. This is Sonic worn down and just, he's had it. <laughs> you know, he's done sassing. He's beyond that point. And this gives you insight to how he views Metal Sonic and other robots. He says to Metal, in a way, Eggman really didn't get a chance to stay reformed thanks to Starline. But you, you had a chance and you just had to go back to him, didn't you? You couldn't be like Gemeral or Omega. You had to be a one-note jerk. And see, if you go back to when Sonic let Metal run free, I still think that was a pretty stupid move, and I don't know if that's really in line with what I know him to be as a character, but if you go back to the OVA, or if you go back to all this other satellite media, and again, you use the references of these other robots that can think for themselves and make their own decisions, you can see that Sonic sees Metal as his own person, and holds him accountable for his actions, even if he is a robot programmed to serve Eggman. And speaking of, he jumps into this, and this is where he just starts talking crap to Sonic, reminding him that, yeah, he's a robot, and even if you neutralize the hardware, his software still demands battle and conquest. If he was made safe, then his sole desire would to be made dangerous. And while I do think it is important to talk about who's at fault for what, and the larger moral implications of this entire event, we do know that this is, at the end of the day, a licensed comic book, and they can't really do too much different from the status quo. It will always have to go back to that. These comics can't make drastic changes for the canon, even if this isn't part of the game canon. Still, they do take the time to discuss these as probably as deeply as they can, <laughs> with Eggman reminding Sonic that whether you like it or not, you're still kind of responsible for all of this happening. And Sonic retorts like, look, man, I didn't dump all this goo all over the world. That's on you. And Eggy responds, sure, that is the case, but thanks to you, I was able to get restored, Metal was able to get restored, and even putting that aside, considering that you're fighting off the infection, how much of it has mutated from all those failed attempts to run it off? And how much of that mutation has spread from him hitting other Zombots? How many miles of infected grass did he cross or pelt help spread? And Sonic is Sonic. We've already dealt with that character arc with Tangles. Sonic is not gonna let Eggman get in his head. And Eggy's like, look man, even if we clear all of this up, I've still infected you with that germ of doubt. And even if you shake off the metal virus, you will not be able to shake that off. And again, it goes to show you the relationship between these two characters. Yeah, Eggman is used to losing. He's used to having Sonic clean up his mess and getting things back to order. But considering how far things have gotten, Sonic can't fix things without Eggman. And addressing Sonic's actions and decisions, as indirectly as they may be, still affected the world in some way. And leaving Sonic with that little shred of doubt, that hit to his confidence, that's enough for Eggman. Even that little thing is a victory for him. And I guess he has to take what he can get, so whatever. It's a very interesting back and forth between these longtime rivals. But then we cut over to the face ship, and I already told you about Zavok and discovering Angel Island, and Orbot and Cubot trying to throw him off base, distract him, and all this other stuff. But QB tells Zavok that the metal virus is making an alert thingy. Something's going on. And it sends Zavok running, and this is like, what is that drawing? <laughs> it's, it's just so goofy. I don't know. Whatever. The point is to get Zavok out of the room and Rouge enters. Two robots ask when Rouge plans to grab the emeralds away from Zavok, and she will deal with that within her own time. What's more important is that Orbot and Cubot send the coordinates of the rest of the six to Amy's team. It's now or never. They have to attack right now, and they all have to attack together. They can't give them the chance to group up and use the emeralds to their full capacity, and that's exactly what they do. They open up the portals, Sonic wishes them luck, and the teams head off to face off with their opponents. Tails and Amy, Espio, Silver and Whisper, the Babylon Rogues. I just realized this, this franchise has both the word Rouge and Rogues. <laughs> 
<laughs> I always get those mixed up. Oh my god, that's so confusing. Anyway, we have this sweet moment between Jimral and Cream, who gives her a hug and says that he will be back soon. And Cream says that this isn't goodbye because I'm going to. <laughs> and she breaks free from the hug and leaps into the portal with Jimral following behind her. Whatever the plan was, it's out the window as Cream just lands right in front of Xena. Says, "Yay, hey, you're you're being mean. You give me that gem right now. I'm gonna beat your ass." And then immediately Xena takes control of Jim. <laughs> All right, so that's not going well. And it's not going well for the rest of the team as we switch over to Tails and Amy. And they just walk right up to Zamom and just try to trick him. He is dumb as a prick. And they basically say, hey, Zavik sent us. They said, we're going to need that Chaos Emerald. And Zami basically says, no, man, I'm going to eat you. Or squash you. I don't know. Something like that. Stupid potato head. Monk. We switch over to SBO, who logically makes himself invisible and then attaches himself to that weird moon mech. But unfortunately, he smelled out by the Zeddy, who just grabs him by the arm and chucks him into a swarm of Zombots. And over in Orchardville, we have Silver and Whisper hiding out, figuring out a plan of action against Emo Boy. And the battle plan is, Silver's basically gonna just attack directly, Whisper's gonna cover him. He approaches saying that, hey, I'm from a ruined future, thanks to you, so give me that emerald. And Emo Boy is like, uh, nope. And well, just waves off Silver's psychic abilities. Rut row. And then, we switch on over to Winterberg, where we have have Zik commanding different squads of Zombots. He's going to spread the infection as quickly and effectively as possible. But just then, the Babylon rogues arrive and immediately get knocked off their extreme gear. And Jets specifically is taken over by Master Zix, who is just, who is just airboarding now. So yeah, he's basically clipped these birds' wings and they drop into the center of a Zombot horde. He sends the two extreme gear back to their respective owners and just knocks them on their ass. But Jet leaps up and knocks Zick off his board and takes it back. And Jet, of course, brags, but Zick reminds him, well, hey, man, that's not going to save your friends. So, yeah, things aren't looking super great for our teams, but we're not going to stop here. Let's just keep on rolling through and see how these particular fights play out. Starting with Tails and Amy, who are on the run from Zamom, who's just waving his arms around. But again, remember, this is Tails and Amy. They've been in more than a couple of scuffles as Amy turns around and just takes a hammer to his fat face. But even with both of them attacking, he's not going down. So Tails is going to have to get a little clever here. And it's not going to take much. This guy is an idiot. He basically just tells him, hey, I dropped my lunch over there. Why don't you go get it? And <laughs> it sends him running off. Like, with a character this stupid, you have to wonder how effective he actually can can be as a team member. But I guess he shows his worth when he's hungry and pissed that he's not getting food as he sends Zombots after our heroes. Tails and Amy head up to get higher ground. Zomom starts rumbling and chasing behind them and just starts bringing buildings down to get them back on his level. He chases them underground and they head on over to a gate. Tails tells Amy to wait for her command and at the right time, she smashes a wheel with her hammer and it sends the gate crashing down onto Zom. Which, <laughs> good thing he's stretchy, because man, that, that does not look fun. Yeah, they had to get real creative and find something real heavy to get this guy to stay still, especially with a Chaos Emerald powering him. And Tails grabs his Chaos Emerald, leaving him to the Zombots. And um, I don't know why they're coming up on him now, or any of these characters. I thought that they could control robots. I don't, I don't know. Dramatic effect, I guess. Back over at Sunset City, we see Xena just sitting and cackling as she sends Jemrel off to take care of Cream. And Cream once again pleads to Jemrel, reminding him that he wanted her to be safe. And the Jemrel she knows is too tough to be pushed around. You have a kind heart. So yes, it's cheesy, it's corny, but you know Jemrel's a sucker for it. And he sends his fist into the side of his head. And this is interesting because I don't think we've ever had any of the robot abilities of the Deadly Six ever ever explained in the game. And this tells us that there's got to be an electromagnetic signal that they can send out to take control of machines. That's why General smashed the side of his head. He destroyed his wireless receiver and in turn, freeing himself from the control of Xena, who is now irritated that she's got to get up and actually get her hands dirty. And thanks to the power of the Chaos Emerald, she's not completely without extra abilities as she takes direct control of General's hands and feet, swinging him around like a puppet. He can't do anything about 
about it. And Jemrel just tells Cream, hey, I can't do anything about this. You need to get out of the way. And Cream, <laughs> I've seen this in a minute. She revs up into a spin dash and rockets off into Xena directly. She's a smart kid. She understands to take out the puppet master, not the puppet. And I guess she's smashing like the energy tether between her and Jemrel. <laughs> she's stomping it with her foot and she's just mad as hell. She hates fighting and she hates seeing her friends hurt and scared. <laughs> she hates how mean Xena is. <laughs> and she just whips Jemrel around, knocking Cream to the ground and sending him off into a pile of Zombots to be torn apart. She then turns her attention back to Cream and just straight up kicks her in the gut and holds her up by the ear. And she just talks shit. She holds her arm behind her back while holding her up by the ears and presents her to the Zombots. I mean, look, we're gonna take a look at the other fights, but I'm telling you right now, this is the most brutal of all of them. Now, in the comic itself, this is where we cut to Amy and Tails, but since we already explained how that fight went, we're just gonna keep going with Cream and Xena. But it's important to note that a little time has passed here. As she says, her arm is starting to cramp. This has been cathartic, but we're done here. Just then, Gemral frees himself from the Zombots as she can no longer focus her control over him. And he rockets to her, grabs her by the hair, and just straight up Loki's her, man. Like, just sends her crashing into the ground. Like, like over his head, into the ground. He takes a hold of Cream and begins to make his escape. But Xena's not done with him as she once again takes control of his arms and legs. But again, it is important to note that these are physical energy beams because Jemrel begins to fly around Xena and ties her up with her own energy, telling Cream to grab the emerald, which she does. Which, of course, frees Jemrel from the energy beams. I wonder if that's a reference to Knuckles Chaotic. I don't know. Anyway, he pulls up right behind Xena and says, you hurt Cream. And uh, it's moments like this why you understand why Sonic will see robots as their own beams because Jemrel is pissed. And he once again grabs Xena by the hair, flips her around, and sends her flying into a pile of Zombots as they grab her from all directions and infect her while she screams. Jemrel goes to console an exhausted Cream. And this is why it's important to point out that there was a little time that had passed because um, Xena said that we're done here. And from the reader's perspective, it could mean that she's going to hold her up to the Zombots, get her infected, and then we're going to be finished. But she meant that literally because as it turns out, she was already exposed to the Zombots. As she says to Gemral, I've got sick. She holds out the emerald to the robot, saying that I don't want to make the other sick, so you're going to have to go back on your own. And she just has this mo the most heartbroken face that even a robot is going to feel something looking at that face. You know what I mean? She covers her eyes and says that she'll be brave. It's just like watching a scary movie. She'll be fine. A portal opens up, and Jemrel just chucks the emerald in. That's the most important thing to get back to the rest of the group. He then picks Cream up and flies her over Sunset City, just in case this is the last thing she'll ever see, and tells her, I will stay with you until you are well. And look, I'm going to be honest with you guys. I, uh, the, the rest of the fights do not hit like that one does. Cream's been an MVP through this entire arc. This is the first time we've seen her in this canon. She's lost her mom. She's lost her chow. She's been through a lot. And she flat out faced a chaos-powered Zeddy basically on her own. She is hardcore, and this has been one hell of an arc for her. And man, it is... Ian, you just had to throw one more heartbreaking moment before the end of all this, didn't you? Crying out loud, man. I can't take this. Now, let's just, let's just get to the rest of them. Like, who? Ugh. Look, you know Silver and Whisper are badasses. This emo kid doesn't stand a chance. And Silver just fights him head on. And unfortunately, emo boy is holding his own while talking trash to him. And this is an interesting setup because, remember, this depiction of Silver is an overwhelmingly positive guy. And he's facing off a guy who revels in misery. But fight plays out exactly like you'd expect. Whisper has her wisps set up the different diamonds. And they shoot off and just knock the emerald off of this annoying hot topic reject. Silver takes a hold of it and just crushes his owl bot and they head on back to Angel Island leaving the emo boy to the Zombots and again I don't understand why they're not responding to him. I mean even without the emeralds. Maybe I missed a throwaway line. I don't know. Again this is more for dramatic effect but we'll, uh, we'll get to it. We then turn our attention back to Riverside with Espio. We got Zaz basically just blasting everything apart trying to hit this dude and just reveling in all the chaos. But Espio 
Espio keeps a cool head, throws some ninja crap around, gets up onto a roof, and while the purple Zeddy is busy just destroying this house, Espio just stealths up behind him and just beats his ass down. I mean, I'm talking like purple on purple violence here, man. And Zaz says, that's not bad, but Zavok's done way worse. Again, flat out stating that Zavok straight up beats his team. And Zaz is like ready for round two. And Espio's like, no need. I've already won. And then just whooshes off. Zaz calls him a coward, but then he looks down and sees that the Chaos Emerald has been replaced by a note saying that justice is served. Signed, the Chaotix Detective Agency, given a little symbol for each of the three members. Espio hops back into the warp portal, saying that while he was the only one here in body, you were here in spirit. And it shows a reflection of his two missing comrades. And finally, we return our attention to Jet and Zit. We have Wave and Storm holding off the Zombots best they can, with Zit talking crap to Jet's leadership abilities. Again, we're going with some great setups between all of these characters here. Zit says, you don't sacrifice your own unless you gain the advantage. All he needs to do is utter a single command and Jet will have lost everything. He asks Jet to humor an old man and just beg for mercy. It's been so long since he's crushed an enemy under his own heel. What a dirty old boy. My goodness. And Jet, man, he says we're the Babylon rogues. We don't beg, we don't give up, and we don't lose and just blast the crap out of Master Zick. Sends him rocketing over to Storm, who just... <laughs> <laughs> Dude just, his entire fist takes up his entire body. He just decks his entire body. And Wave just grabs the green emerald off of his body as he's rocketing into a pile of zombots. Wave tells Jet to take the emerald and go. She's lost her extreme gear. Storms has been smashed to bits. He's the only one with a working one, so take it and go. And Jet instead attaches the green emerald to his green board and sends it flying back in to the portal and back to Angel Island. Standing with his crew, he says, didn't you hear me say it to the old man? We're the Babylon rogues and we don't lose. That means all of us. Sonic will get the emerald and do his hero thing. And until then, let's show these Zombots a real challenge. And look, I gotta tell you, I've never been a big fan of the Babylon rogues or the Deadly Six. Part of that's because I've not played through all the writers games. I heard the stories are a lot of fun, so I'm excited to do that eventually. But my point is, I've not given these characters a lot of attention myself, but just reading through these stories and these particular face-offs, it's just been a wild ride. And when you see these characters in such a dire predicament, predicaments put together by the deadly six of all characters, and we get to see Jet really show what he's worth, it's just, man, taking some of the most mock characters, characters that have literally never interacted before, part of completely different generations of games in this franchise, and just merging them together so well and telling such exciting stories and fights with them is man bravo this is a lot of fun but yes everyone has been on some level or another successful in retrieving the chaos emeralds and we return our attention to angel island as everybody is returning around the same time as per the plan and let's pay special attention to the ones that don't have their teams returning i like this little bit of art here showing metal sonic grabbing the extreme gear i mean it's really a nothing thing but i do like that they pay enough attention to know that that an extreme gear would be rocketing off and Metal Sonic's really the only one that could retrieve it quickly. <laughs> I do love that little bit of art with him holding the board. He looks so interested. Like, later, Dad, I'm gonna go be a pro skater. Sonic in turn catches the red emerald and the realization hits him that Cream is still back there with the Zombots. And Sonic tells him to focus up Gemerald's with her. She'll be all right because we're gonna make things right. Silver looks on forlorn, says that with only two more emeralds, he can become Super Sonic and save us all. But Sonic says he's been thinking about that. In the future, everything had been infected, and Sonic reasons that all of this must have happened already, but there's something different now than what happened then. The difference is Silver is with them, and they're gonna have to rely on that one difference to pull this off. And Sonic says he's going to need Silver's help to do this. But whatever they're planning on doing, they better do it fast. Because as it turns out, Zavik has found Angel Island, and is preparing the Spaceship to attack. No 
Okay, so the face ship is now face to face with Angel Island. Zavok has found our heroes. We got Tails freaking out. And Eggman's like, yeah, obviously. Rouge, we're out of time. Whatever you plan on doing, do it. And on the ground level behind the face ship, we see all of our characters that we've lost during this saga roaming up onto the island, falling behind Zavok's ship. So even from there, he's got total command of this Zombot army. And he's got them converging on Angel Island. And let's take a moment to once again appreciate the fact that Zavik, one of the most joked about characters in the Sonic franchise, is just full on terrifying right now. And man, he's gonna go big and go hard, quite literally. Getting ahead of myself. I love this moment here where we see Zavik overlooking Angel Island. You gotta remember, he comes from Lost Hex. This is the first time he's seen this landmass, and he shows a bit of respect for it. He says it looks smaller than Lost Hex, but it's no less beautiful, and he cannot wait to bathe it in the metal virus. But something's gone awry with the ship. He turns around and sees Rouge just admiring the gray chaos emerald. She says, goodness, does this one emerald power this whole ship? She says that she wanted to pull this off a little bit more elegantly, but you do what you gotta do. And says, tuck and roll, boys. And we see Orbot and Cubot take the shape of an orb and a cube as they hop on off the face ship. The original plan was to grab both the chaos emeralds, but since that's not currently an option, the next best bet is just take down the entire face ship. And that's exactly what Rouge does. With one fell swoop, it goes crashing into the earth below. And our heroes look on. We have Eggman who's just lamenting the fact that he's lost his best ship to date. At least that's what he says. And again, there's been a lot of Zombots surrounding that spot right there, right below them. <laughs> We have Sonic just going, ugh. Glad the Zombots can survive something like that. Yeesh. Rouge touches base with the rest of the team. Sonic asking, yeah, you knew the Zombots could survive that, right? And Rouge, yeah, I actually believe her when she says that she did her research. Uh, you're welcome, by the way. Now, the plan from here is to just go through the rubble and pick up the last Chaos Emerald from Zavik. Once, you know, the fires and everything calm down. Unfortunately, as Eggy points out, that's not going to be an option. As we see Zavik pull himself from the wreckage and you uses his Chaos Emerald to just go kaiju size on us here. That's right, kids. We got Fury Zavok now. And he's now at eye level with Angel Island just standing up. And he just shoots fire at the island itself. Just rocking the entire thing. And Knuckles, ha <laughs> ha! And Knuckles like, did you just spit on my island? Now everybody else has done their part. It's time for Sonic to get to work. They're out of options. He hands off the Emerald to Silver, who holds up the other six, and he gets his friends in gear, telling Tails and Rouge that he needs air support and tells Silver to tag along. But before they can do anything else, Zavok picks up a handful of Zombots and just chucks them at Angel Island. Now, again, things have been a little inconsistent here because he just full-on grabs Zombots without showing any kind of infection. But I think that goes to show us subtly that the Emeralds and their energy aren't affected by this plague, and that will be very important very soon. But right now, Zavik is just lobbing Zombots onto Angel Island. The last place for Sonic and his team to recoup and recover is gone, and the heroes are now faced off against their turned zombified friends. So yeah, that's where issue 28 ends. That's the part I left off from last time. We're jumping straight into 29, and they start off basically just telling us what we just saw there. It gives us a little clarification. Turns out the Chaos Emerald has amplified Zavik's electromagnetic powers, so that helps him navigate the Zombot Chucks straight to Sonic and his team. And they point out that there's literally nowhere else to run. Sonic's Zombot infection is no longer being pushed back by his speed. This is do or die. Knuckles is frustrated, telling Sonic that he always brings trouble to his island. And Sonic, as exhausted as he is, tries to reassure him, saying, yeah, things look bleak, but don't worry, I got a plan trust me. And this, I just, this just goes to show how much these two have grown as friends over the years. I mean, I go back to Sonic 3 and Knuckles, where Knuckles just wanted to kill this guy, and now, like, this is, like, Knuckles' best friend. And as furious 
as he is for Sonic bringing another problem to his island, he does trust him. Because the first thing he does is knock Zombot Shadow right in the face. And he tells Sonic, you better do what you gotta do or else I'm gonna haunt you. And yes, this is a desperate moment. And yes, this is Knuckles doing whatever he can to protect his home and the Master Emerald and the refugees. This shows you how much trust this guy has in Sonic. Even if he goes down, he trusts Sonic to take care of his home yet again. He trusts Sonic to take care of this world. And he tells him they're going to hold off these Zombots as best as they can. So get out there and save the day already. And Sonic wastes no time as him and Silver come rushing off. And as he zips by Metal, he tells him, Yo, dude, we're going to need you too. Come along. And Eggy gives him the go-ahead, saying that this is the only way to save him. Activate your defensive measures and just do what Sonic says. Says. And we have Sonic being held up by Metal Sonic as him and Metal and Silver go leaping off of Angel Island to face off against Giant Zavok. And even at that size, he has his eyes dead set on the Hedgehog. And he's just talking shit the whole time. This is your last show of resistance. This is all you can do. You may have destroyed my means of creating more Metal Virus, but I still command the Zombots. And with them, I will infect everything. I will see your world grow sick and perish and just lunges Zombots at the trio. And we got Metal Sonic dipping and diving. He is really all that's keeping Sonic alive at this point. I what? I, oh, oh. He tells Metal to head straight for the Chaos Emerald. That is all that matters. And Zavok is just blasting everything left and right. Shoots right at Metal and Sonic. And Metal puts up his Dark Shield. Babe. Oh my god, yes! Yeah, even with Chaos Emerald powers, his stupid fireballs got nothing on that shield. And Sonic says, boy, I'm glad me and Tails didn't deactivate you when we had the chance. Which, <laughs> we'll get to it. And Zavik reaches for the shielded hedgehogs, but is blocked off by Silver's psychokinesis. Sonic thanks him for the assist, but reminds him to keep a hold of the six emeralds. And Silver tells him, you focus on the one in Zavik's chest. Sonic then commands Metal, get him in close, but unfortunately Zavik just gusts a bunch of wind at them and sends him flying to the earth below. Sonic picks himself amongst the rubble <laughs> it's actually with Orbot and Cubot. Good to see they survived their fall. And Orby just tells him, hey man, you're not looking good. You probably should start running. And Sonic tells him, and again the reader, unfortunately that doesn't seem to be working anymore. And Orbot says, no, you, you don't get me, man. I don't mean for yourself. I mean run away from them. As the Zombots who were caught in that rubble begin to crawl up out of the ground. Zombie stuff. Man, I love that imagery. And Sonic is just, he is worn down, dude. He is exhausted. There's not much left he can do. And he says, if I could just get enough speed, I can run up to the Emerald. But yeah, man, he's not looking good. And his friends aren't looking good either. We got Tails trying to shake off the two Chow. We got Knuckles, who's getting more and more infected, fighting off Zombot Shadow. We got Whisper crying, her gun shaking in her hand, pointing it directly at the zombified Tangle. We got Espio dodging the other two of the detective agency. And we have Eggman crawling away in fear from a zombified Big the Cat. <laughs> But he's saved at the last second by Amy, who takes a hammer to Big's chest. And she says, oh man, that didn't do anything. And Eggman, the piece of garbage he is, boots Amy into Big, getting her infected, saying, on the contrary, he actually slowed him down for me. And he takes off towards their own shuttle to save himself. But then he slips on the Zombot Froggy. <laughs> who leaps up into the air, and that is what takes Eggman out. That silly little frog. And Knuckles, our boy, goes down like a champ, fighting till the last against Zombot Shadow, just pummeling him into his precious island below. But unfortunately, that can only go for so long as Knuckles is turned. And we see Tails in everybody's favorite position, holding his head in the fetal position, begging for Sonic's help. But unlike Sonic Forces, this 
this is actually earned. Tails has been fighting to the last this entire time, and we see that the Chow have grabbed onto his tails. He is infected. He is being turned. There is nothing left for him to do. All that's left is in the hands of Sonic. And I'm sorry, I know you guys get upset when you see Tails cowering and in fear, but he's still a kid, and eventually that bravery is going to wane, and at least we can justify this. Unlike being a coward in front of Chaos Zero out of nowhere like a punk bitch. But yes, this is here to show us that things are not going good for our heroes. Everybody's been infected. And Sonic, out of energy, looks like he is about to go down as well as he is swarmed by Zombots. But then is saved by Metal Sonic! Are you kidding? Yes! Oh my god, dude. This team up. Holy cow. Metal comes in, saves the day, and gets Sonic back up into the fight. Zavok again turns his attention to Sonic and reminds him machines are his to control and sends Metal flying. Sonic drops onto Zavok himself and blasts his way over to the Chaos Emerald, cutting it loose and throwing it into the air to Silver as his last bit of consciousness begins to fade as the Metal Virus finally takes over his body. But in that last sliver, all seven Chaos Emeralds are combined. Not only do we get Super Sonic, we get Super Silver! Boosh! And after all of this time, we see the Metal Virus once and for all flake away off of Sonic's body. He is finally cured, and now it's time to save the world. But before he does, Zavok comes in with the fist saying, with the last of my strength, I will crush you. But Super Sonic is having none of it, and with half a panel, just beats his ass. Just bah, 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 and just takes him down. Half of a page. That is it for Zavok. Scott is dead. Get your Nick Jr. designed ass out of here, you Bowser wannabe piece of garbage you're out and silver says i was a little anticlimactic but sonic points out yo talk we don't have time they got the chaos emerald and the warp topaz is not reacting great to all of this energy so they gotta do what they gotta do and with silver's now amped up abilities the warp topaz and the purifying energy of the chaos emeralds they begin to cure the world and one by one we see our characters celebrate and reunite tears of joy streaming down their faces, Whisper finally embracing her best friend again, Team Chaotix finally together, chanting along their dope-ass theme song, Froggy sitting atop of an embarrassed Eggman, Knuckles and Shadow very confused to see each other, <laughs> pissed off at Rouge, who just... <laughs> Who has not been helping? Look, she took on the face ship, all right? Like, if she's gonna go down, she's gonna hang out with the Master Emerald. I love her. She's the best. We even see Scruffy return to normal. We see Vanilla back in action. And we see Cream reunited with her mother. Because General's been with her this entire time and brought her back the moment it was safe. I just, man, happy endings all around. But we then turn our attention back to Sonic and Silver. They've been flying around the world, absorbing all of the metal virus. And Sonic is going to send it into the sun through the warp portal, where it can never do damage to anyone ever again. But the warp topaz is becoming unstable, so they gotta kick it into high gear. And we do just that. And as Silver finally confirms that the metal virus is once and for all destroyed, Destroyed. The Warp Topaz has hit its breaking point and lets off a blinding explosion in the sky and sends Silver rocketing back down to Angel Island. Tails, Knuckles, and Amy go to his location, asking if he's okay, asking what happened. And he confirms that the metal virus has been removed. It has been destroyed. The nightmare is finally over. But unfortunately, Sonic tried to ditch the Warp Topaz into the Super Warp Portal, but ended up going along with it. So yes, we are finally free of the Metal Virus, but it looks like it's come at a hefty cost. But how hefty is it going to be? I mean, this book's titled Sonic the Hedgehog, and we've seen this particular thing happen a couple times. So issue 30 picks up right where 29 ended, with Super Sonic getting himself yeeted along with the Warp Topaz into, well, somewhere we don't know. And this is something I like about comics. You 
Usually once a story ends in other media, they'll do a quick little something and then roll credits. But since comics have to keep going month after month, sometimes you just gotta sit in it. The story has hit its climax, but the camera's gotta keep rolling and now you get to watch all the exhaustive cleanup. And that's the point of these next few issues. It's here to clear off the playmat and get things nice and organized so the next set of stories can take place. And also in this case, so Evan Stanley, who takes on the role as head writer going forward, doesn't have to deal with a lot of loose ends. But not everything is tied up quite so neatly, and in certain cases we will see characters used to tease different stories that Ian Flynn will work on down the road. Tails, Amy, and Knuckles are back to normal, but obviously concerned for their blue buddy. And only Knuckles is feigning any kind of confidence. Sure that Sonic will come floating down any minute now, and we will see that running gag as his confidence starts to waver as this issue carries forward. Now all three of them are confident in Sonic's ability to recover and return, but all of them are worried nonetheless. They're practically family after all. Eggman, on the other hand, has no doubt in his mind that Sonic will make his return. He has known Sonic longer than any of his friends have, and he knows it's only a matter of time before the rodent returns to ruin his fun. So while all of Sonic's idiot friends are busy looking skyward for any sign of the Sparkle Hog, he makes his move and rushes off towards the Resistance shuttle to make his escape and plot his next attack while the little boy Blue is MIA. He still has to get it back up and running, but thankfully, he was playing 4D chess while everyone else was trying to save the world and only used non-essential components while they were creating the multi-war portal to, you know, help stop the metal virus. And while the heroes are spacing on the threat of Eggman, they're also spacing on Zavok and the rest of the Deadly Six. But unlike Eggy, Big Red isn't the type to slink away. If he has any fight left in him, then that's exactly what he'll do. Battered and beaten, he makes his presence known, and Cream basically speaks for the entirety of the Sonic fandom when she tells him to get lost already. <laughs> but it should come to no surprise as Sonic fans that Zavok tells her flatly, no and raises his hand to attack the little rabbit. But she quickly reminds him who is going to win a popularity contest in this fandom, and six her chow after the Bowser faker. And anyone who's played Sonic Advance 2 will tell you that you do not want to be on the bad side of Cheese the Chow. But he's not alone in his attack, as we have the Chaotix and Silver jump in as well. And despite whatever you may think of Zavok, after everything he's endured, he's holding his own pretty well. Granted, nobody in this fight is in tip-top shape at the moment, but still gotta give it up for the gumption here. Thankfully, this story doesn't have to continue to keep its focus on Zavok for too long, as he's finally held in place by Silver's psychic abilities, but it's taking everything Silver has to keep him in check. I also love how we have Shadow just not partaking at all, he just walks by all this nonsense. He didn't like Lost World, he ain't bothering with this. <laughs> So yes, Zavok is captured for the time being, and might as well let you know now, I'm not gonna waste a lot of time going over every member of the Deadly Six. Long and short of it, they're still on the loose in the world below, and Flynn will handle that in a different story arc. As far as we're concerned, their participation in the Metal Virus story is done. We also get this quick scene between Knuckles and Rouge by the Master Emerald. Nothing major, but it's always fun to see them play Batman and Catwoman. Or, well, I guess more Batwoman and... Echidna Man. <laughs> she scolds her for not watching Eggman as they just discover that he escaped and tells her to get off his emerald. Rouge basically tells him to chill and rustles his jimmies as she takes off, which ah, <laughs> it's always fun to see, and leaves Knuckles to stare up at the sky, waiting for his friend to pop back any minute now. We then shift our focus over to Jimroll, who has been trying to track down the source of an Ignit signal, which happens to be coming from Orbot and Cubot, who alert their boss that they've been spotted. Eggman, who almost has the shuttle up and running, commands Metal Sonic to retrieve the duo. And Metal decides to do this by shoving his hand through the back of Jimroll. God, wow. Basically, he's using the robot like a drink carrier. I mean, I get it, it's very efficient. You get three robots instead of two, and you're only using one hand to do it. How convenient. Yeah, this is very brutal. It's one of those unwritten rules in kids' media. You can't show extreme violence against any of the fleshy friends, but robots? Well, anything goes with robots. They're just metal and circuitry, after all. No way this will be scarring imagery for children. <laughs> This attack, as you would expect, sets off the rest of the cast. Whisper fires off a shot, Metal deflects it, but in turn loses his grip on Gemral. So Metal returns to the original mission and just snatches the Shapebots mid-air and rendezvous with the shuttle. Silver has his hands full containing Zavok, and nobody else is quick enough to cover the distance between themselves and Eggy, except for Shadow. 
And before Silver can even ask for assistance, Shadow is rushing straight towards the shuttle. But just as he's about to catch up, he's intercepted by Metal Sonic. And this goes to show why Eggman keeps this robot around, as he not only holds his own against Shadow, but technically wins a fight against him. This just isn't your arc, is it, Shadow? Still, this is a lot of fun to see these two square off. We don't get it too often. And a couple of these panels definitely give me some Sonic OVA vibes. But yeah, Metal's goal isn't to destroy Shadow. It's simply to delay him so Eggman can escape. So he sends out a shockwave that temporarily buries Shadow under a bunch of pine trees. And while Shadow gets himself loose from that mess that gives Metal and Eggman enough time to make their escape with Omega's head in tow. Oh dear. And while they touch upon it later, let's just get it out of the way now. Dr. Starline, who, if you remember, was unceremoniously kicked into his own warp portal and out of the story. We get a quick page showing that he clearly still adores Eggman, but believes that Eggy can only truly succeed with the help of Starline and his focus. We see him hanging out in an Eggman warehouse surrounded by egg pawn, so maybe they still see him as an ally? I don't know. We don't get that explored until the Bad Guys miniseries. The point of this page is just to let you know that the platypus is still around and still plotting. But like the Deadly Six, we are done with him for now. And let's keep wrapping things up. They show this off a little bit later, once all the craziness of Angel Island is sorted out. But Silver finally returns to his home in the future. And once again, they don't show how he time travels, but oh well. And if you recall way back when he first showed up in issue 8, Silver was around in the present during Sonic Forces, and while Ian did his best to explain why Silver was there at all in that prequel comic, the game itself never really bothered to explain, well, anything. But the comic uses that opportunity to do something interesting with the Trunks wannabe. Once Silver returned to his timeline after the war, his world was empty and all the plant life had turned to metal. Something was off about his future. So he once again returned to Sonic's time to figure out what happened. And as we discovered, it was the world overrun by the virus. But now we bookend Silver's story by confirming, with a Sonic CD reference, that they have indeed saved the world. As we see for the very first time in any Sonic media, what Silver's future actually looks like when it's not in the middle of an apocalypse. They keep it vague, we don't see anyone, just a city skyline, and you can tell it's the future because there are holograms dotted around the skyscrapers. It's not a really big deal, but it's nice that it's here. And then we shift our focus over to a character who has not once appeared during the Metal Virus, and that is Blaze the Cat. As longtime Sonic fans know, she is actually a princess in a different dimension, so she's not always present in Sonic's universe, and that's, that's its own thing. But again, we're seeing something we've never seen before in Sonic media, and that is her palace in the Soul Dimension. And I should note, while earlier Archie could get away with pretty much whatever they wanted, all of this stuff now needs to be approved by Sega. So this is as close to canon as these locations are gonna get. At least until Sonic Team changes their minds on a whim, but hey, if they ever bring in Silver's future or Blaze's palace, well, that's a good problem as far as I'm concerned. But we cannot keep all of our attention on the pretty architecture, as a meteor crashes onto the palace courtyard. Blaze, ever the dutiful princess, yes I said princess, despite not ever seeing a king or queen anywhere, she heads on over to investigate, only to discover that this isn't a meteor, it's Sonic the Hedgehog. Thankfully he did not warp along with the metal virus into the sun, but he has instead landed himself into the soul dimension, ruining Blaze's lawn in the process. And while we did jump around a little bit, that's basically where issue 30 ends, and we're going to cover the next couple where I'm going to pick up the pace a little bit, because the point of all of this was just, again, to get the character characters back into a default position to provide closure or provide teasers for upcoming stories. And they continue to do just that, as we transition from the immediate aftermath on Angel Island to the restoration efforts going forward. As you can imagine, the Metal Virus has left quite the impact on the world of Sonic. Starting with Amy, who hands off the leadership position of the restoration effort over to Jewel the Beetle, who has thoroughly established herself with her organization skills. And this serves two purposes. One, this will free up Amy to go on future adventures as crunching numbers and organizing release efforts is tedious, strenuous work, and it doesn't make for great reading. 
so we can't stick Amy behind a desk for too long. She needs to be front and center with the rest of the main cast. And two, this is going to give Jewel a sense of purpose in the wider world of the comic universe. So far, she hasn't had much to do outside of run a museum in a tiny town and play sidekick to Tangle. But now that she's on the world stage with Sonic's crew, it's time for her to step up her role as well. Jewel is not someone who is ever going to get a great deal of attention in these stories. She does play a supporting role, but every time we check in with her, we're going to see a bit of growth in her character and literally the world itself. This is a nice way to get one of the core game characters back into default position while not dropping everything that's been built up with the resistance turning into the restoration, so on and so forth. You know the games are never going to bother explaining why Knuckles became a general or what happened with the resistance once the war was over. None of that stuff. That's why IDW Sonic is going to hopefully make a great companion piece to the series. May or may not be technically canon, but it's never going to get in the way of the canon of the game. Hopefully, anyway, we've had zero mainline games released since Forces came out and this book was based off of the aftermath of that game. But back on track. Point is, the restoration effort is now needed more than ever, as there are a lot of missing folks since the metal virus has been destroyed. And the usually quiet Chaotix Detective Agency is quite busy with missing persons cases. Unfortunately, they're not super organized. They can't keep up with all of these work requests, especially when it's just these three boys trying to take care of everything. Thankfully, Cream, the Chows, Gemeral, and Vanilla all come in to relieve the pressure, as Vanilla goes all boss mama as soon as she walks in the door as she has Jimral take in the missing persons database, the Chow organize all the paperwork, and putting herself and Cream onto the phones, leaving the Chaotix free to go out there and help people out, all while making Vector quite hungry for Rabbit. Lovely nod to Sonic X there. Lola Bunny wished she had this kind of boss lady power. Go get him, mama. Yes, it is indeed Wabbit season, but it's not the only time Adam's art quenches some thirsty fans. We'll have a couple more instances a little bit later. We now have to turn our attention to a set of characters we have not seen since the very start of the saga. Ruff and Tumple, who, while cured from the metal virus, have been trapped at the bottom of a mine this entire time. That is until Tangle drops her tail down to rescue the duo, leaving the poor tailless Tumble a little jealous and heartbroken. <laughs> But as soon as they're rescued, they promise to go back to their rotten ways and the duo run off, only to get themselves lost and, <laughs> spoilers, they're going to be in jail very soon. <laughs> but another important point of this scene is showing how Tails is handling the loss of Sonic, as Tangle asks him how he's doing directly, and he reassures her that he's doing just fine. Sonic's beaten the odds more than a few times, and at this point, Tails know he's going to return, and in the meantime, Sonic is going to be counting on him to keep the peace. This, just like way back in issue 2, feels like the comic addressing how poorly Tails was handled in Sonic Forces. Sonic would not keep Tails around on adventures if he had to constantly save him or keep him out of trouble. Tails is there because he can do what few others can. He can keep up with Sonic and the two of them have grown a lot together. Tails is more than capable on his own, and Sonic himself has grown to rely on him. And they display all of that within a few panels. Good on them. And Tangle points out that Sonic probably wouldn't want them sitting around worrying and moping either. He'd want them to celebrate. So they plan to do just that and start sending out invites. And that leaves Rouge to deliver Shadow's invitation. And to no one's surprise, he declines. But this scene is here to address how Shadow was handled during his brief time during the Metal Virus Saga. Realizing that he goofed up, misinterpreting Sonic warning him to run as cowardice instead of advice to maintain control of the virus, he thinks to himself that it's unacceptable form of the ultimate life form. And I think most everybody agrees. I don't know if this particular scene sits super well with me. It does feel a little jarring and I don't think Shadow was completely in the wrong with everything that Sonic was talking about back then, but it's nice to know that they are listening. And the nice thing about this comic book, it's a continuing storyline. This isn't the only canon you're going to find Shadow the Hedgehog, and this certainly isn't where his story ends. At least the writers understand that fans are frustrated with his interpretation, and they're doing their best to let you know they are aware. <laughs> and I do think Rouge plays something as an audience surrogate because she seems exhausted and somewhat irritated every time she interacts with Shadow here going forward. But after Shadow tells her that he owes Sonic, but he's gone now, she gives him a quick smile. I think she knows that deep down, the Shadow that we know and love is still there. Just, you know, critique where you have to and be patient. <laughs> 
But long and short of it, this is not his story. And I'm not gonna be reading through any more essays in the comments about this guy. I get it, you don't like how he was interpreted, whatever. It's time to party. Despite all the work left to do, despite Sonic still being missing, they all have accomplished quite a lot and they've earned a celebration. We get a well-deserved splash page of pure joy, something we have not seen for quite a long time. And while Vector's proportions look a little off while he's dancing, this is a damn sight better than the last time we saw him cut loose at a party. And like I said earlier, Adam's art further fuels this thirsty fan base with a cute little back and forth between Tangle and Whisper. The wolf is careful keeping an eye on the Babylon rogues who spoilers attempt to steal jewelry but it's not there thanks to Rouge I'm not gonna waste my time with that it's there point is they don't see themselves as heroes and they're not gonna be interacting with the rest of the cast but they were still invited all the same because they did help save the world and I do think it's precious that they showed up at all <laughs> And while this is a kid's comic, they can't show you anybody drinking. But the rosy cheeks of Tangle tell a different story. No way she's not a party girl. She is sloshed. And with an arm around Whisper, which gets her wagging her adorable little tail, <laughs> Tangle tells the pup to chill out and have some fun. But unfortunately, before they can do that, Eggman crashes the party. And wow, I just, I love that silhouette on the last page of issue 31. It's just fantastic art. I'll get into that in just a second. But I do want to address a few comments I've been seeing as this coverage has been going on, something I've been pushing in these episodes. And that is that the Metal Virus arc would make for one hell of a video game. And it wouldn't be much of a Sonic game without one final boss fight with Eggman. And no, I know Perfect Chaos and Bio Lizards and Solaruses exist. I no, there are different final boss encounters, but Eggy has shoved in one last boss fight into the last set of games fairly regularly, and he's not about to stop now. As he attacks in an oversized Omega mech. Oh... Um, egg? Uh? There's an egg pun in there somewhere. Sort it out amongst yourselves. But yeah, this isn't just a giant Omega robot. Eggman is using Omega himself as the core. Omega apparently is a very valuable bot, and his combat routines can cause quite the havoc when used in the wrong hands. And Eggie doesn't stop there, because as Gemral attacks, he launches off a set of wires that incorporates Gemral into this giant mech. This further amplifies the capabilities of these machines, and this has two of Eggman's most powerful wayward robots back under his control. And they're gonna show how potent of a force they can be combined. And just to deviate for a moment, this dynamic pose Adam draws for Gemral immediately made me think of Spaz's art back in the early days of Archie. His Mechasonic stuff specifically. Now Spaz is one hell of an artist. He can emulate pretty much every official Sonic art style out there. But early on, he really had a style unlike any anything else in the franchise, bringing in a lot of detail while adding a sense of dimension to these characters. They don't look like just flat drawings. They look like they're taking up a 3D space. And yeah, some of it looks a little weird nowadays, but the talent is undeniable. And his insane skills kept me coming back month after month, even with stories I didn't particularly like even as a kid. And they sure as hell inspired me all the time as an artist. And I would not be surprised in the slightest to learn that Adam Bryce Thomas also drew inspiration from Spaziante. Either way, Adam is easily one of my most favorite artists currently working on Sonic. This is fantastic stuff. And in some fun ways, it's cool to see what I used to think was just a treat, that being the covers of Sonic comics, actually carry forth into the pages themselves. I can't tell you, after growing up with early Archie, how nice it is to see consistently fantastic art in Sonic comic books, because that was, uh, that was not a thing for a very long time. <laughs> and also to stick on the art, like I said, Adam knows how to get Sonic Twitter all hot and bothered. I think it's time we finally turn our attention back to Sonic himself, and to a set of pages that just got all of those shippers up in a tizzy for a couple of days with these shots of Sonic. As for what's actually going on in this scene, basically Sonic's lost his memory. He has no idea who he is, and Blaze is trying to figure it all out. And while this is a fun callback to Mr. Tinker and a fun premise that we could really expand upon, this was really only here to delay the inevitable return of the Hedgehog. We spend most of our time with the supporting cast in these three issues. We really only get this one scene at tea time, and the next time they focus on Sonic, Blaze is pulling out her set of magical MacGuffins, the Soul Emeralds, and uses them to help Sonic get back to his senses. Yes, we really had two sets of Emeralds and a warp Topaz help sort out all of the issues of this saga. <laughs> 
So yes, while they spread these scenes apart, this is really sorted out in no time flat. And Blaze's short cameo comes to a close as she sends Sonic back to his home dimension. But not before Sonic speaks for the fan base and tells her to stop by from time to time. Everybody misses her. And with that, he's sent off in a blaze of glory. And just in time too. While his friends have been holding their own against the Omega Mech, things aren't looking good. Thankfully, they at least managed to cut General loose after Tails and Rouge tracked down a port so Tails could hack into the program. Wasn't too hard to find because, as they assumed, Eggman built this bot in a rush and it is a little janky in design. But it is still a threat. But with General now loose, it does cut down the capability of the robot. But Eggman isn't defenseless as he just pulls out a Glock and tries to ice Tails. Everyone gets Shadow so much shit for packing heat, yet you got Eggman here packing a very powerful pistol. <laughs> On top of this, Omega himself is doing his best to fight against the programming of the larger mech. So caught between being forced to attack his friends and wanting to kill Eggman, the bot stalls, leaving an opening for the characters to attack. Again, I appreciate how Flynn writes this like a proper video game boss fight. Even sets up how the weak points would be laid out. This is awesome. Unfortunately, all of this is not quite enough as Eggman reigns in Omega and renews his attack against the exhausted heroes in Spiral Hill Village, only to be interrupted by the returning Sonic. And let's appreciate this cool little doodle of him brushing off Ash while standing in the middle of a gigantic fireball like it ain't no thing. This might be the closest we ever get to an official burning Sonic form so soak it in and of course with the arrival of sonic this battle is wrapped up nice and quick sonic just cuts loose omega who then turns back around and takes out his giant doppelganger in a barrage of bullets and missiles but once his armory is depleted omega falls to pieces again this leaves eggman once again cursing sonic seeing that he'll be back again with yet another scheme and sonic while in a jojo reference tells him to bring it on because he will always be ready to take him on. And as Eggman flies off, Sonic looks on, hoping that someday Robotnik will come around. It's a tall order to be sure, but Sonic's a hopeful one, and after seeing what he can potentially be with Mr. Tinker, he can better understand where Sonic is coming from. And of course, Amy runs in for a hug, followed by Tails, followed by everybody as Tangled grabs them all and brings them in for a giant group hug. But unfortunately, a hero's work is never done, as Spiral Hill is still on fire after the Eggman attack. So they spend the rest of the night quelling the flames and getting things back in order. As the morning sun peeks over the horizon, Sonic finally takes a moment to sit back, relax, and reflect. Appreciating how good it is to be back, to be healthy again, and hoping that he can someday see his friends Silver and Blaze without the need of a world-ending event to bring them all together. But even after everything he has just gone through, Sonic's not the type to lay around for too long. And with a stretch, he hops off the roof and runs towards the morning light, excited for whatever adventure this new day brings. And with that, I am finally done summarizing the Metal Virus Saga. Was it perfect? Nah, not by any stretch. There's a lot to nitpick here. Why were the gloves effective if the virus can only affect living tissue? Why didn't the characters just cover themselves from head to toe in hazmat suits? The characterization of Shadow certainly rubbed a lot of fans the wrong way, and a lot of the time it felt like Ian was writing himself into a corner, trying to tackle every possible solution for this virus, only to squash it so they can continue to raise the stakes, which inevitably just left to us once again returning to the Chaos Emeralds to fix all the problems here. And on top of all that, I can't help but consider Sonic's morality here. Like, I get it. I know we have to go back to a default status each and every time, but at the end of the day, if Eggman is causing this much carnage and drama, at some point you have to ask yourself, when is it morally okay to keep him alive, as opposed to just getting rid of him once and for all? And obviously, we know the real world answer. It's the same reason why Batman won't kill the Joker, even though at this point, it's obviously the more morally justified thing to do. Not even out of revenge, we just know time and again he's going to escape and he's going to kill a lot more people, and you could save a ton of lives if you just took him out of the equation. And that is the same case with Eggman, who literally caused a zombie apocalypse. Now, Ian is not oblivious to this situation. They bring this up time and again. This is an obvious thing that Sonic has to tackle 
and deal with through this entire saga. This has been building since his first encounter with Mr. Tinker. And by the end of it, I still don't know if I think that Sonic is right here. We use that conversation with Tangled to kind of justify everything he's been doing, saying that he is not responsible for Eggman or what he does. And also, you know, he can't really waste time lamenting what has happened. They're in the middle of this now and they got to get it sorted out, which I do agree that is far more important than having a pity party. But at the same time, I don't think Espio was wrong in criticizing Sonic. Shadow certainly wasn't. Was he sloppy and got himself zombified? Yeah, that was a dumb move. I really do think Shadow should have been used as a counterpoint to how Sonic handles the situation, who got himself infected just by spinballing into an infected. Shadow should be more precise. He should be used, again, as a counter argument to Sonic's morality. And if he was taken out, I really don't think it should have been his own fault. I don't think Shadow should have been the central focus, as a lot of fans seem to want him to be. But at the same time, he's a far more efficient fighter than this. Him not knowing that Sonic was infected or how he was holding his virus in check, none of that made sense to me. Like, Shadow should have all that ready to go. And in turn, he should be used to further Sonic's guilt. Starline as well was a great counterpoint to Eggman, who directly addresses this unhealthy cycle these two characters seem to be in. And it's just frustrating because I guess we all know, as longtime fans, that this always has to go back to the set standard. Especially nowadays, where they can't be as bold as the Archie series just let them be before. Again, I do at least appreciate that Ian is aware of this, and is at least directly criticizing this unhealthy cycle that these two seem to be in. At the end of the day, Sonic still has to be seen as a hero. That's why Tails couldn't come up with a solution. That's why Sonic himself couldn't have been an infected because he technically was the one that screwed up, let Tinker go, let Metal Sonic go, and in turn made everything nice and convenient for Starline to get all of this mess in order. And Sonic being the hero here, he still has lessons to learn and he still had to clean up this mess he somewhat helped create. And in that sense, I think the story works very well. I do have some other grabs, but another Another major one I have is that the saga just happened way too soon in the life of this book. This world feels empty. It doesn't feel like we spent enough time building this particular universe or spent enough time with these characters, both old and new. And I am seeing elements that were used from Ian's run on Archie. We can see disparate story ideas from the world robotization stuff, and I know that this was just the seed of an idea back in his mind back then. Nothing was really planned out, but this really feels like this would have had a lot more impact in a more expansive world like Archie post or pre-reboot. But on that particular front, I think part of the blame lies at the feet of Sega themselves. 30 years of this franchise is more than enough time to have a more defined universe at this point. And whether or not it's canon, this comic is based on the world of modern Sonic. And while we've had the term modern Sonic for a grand total of 10 years now, we're still not even sure what's going on with him and classic Sonic. Are they the same person? Are they from two different worlds? We don't know. You can tell they still have to remain vague on elements like how Silver can time travel. And I get it. It leaves more room for crazy crazy random adventures for years to come in the games. How else can they explain why Lost Hex just suddenly appeared out of nowhere? They can't just show off the entire world. Oh, well never mind. I guess they can show off the world. They just keep the maps inconsistent from game to game. Perfect. On the other hand, though, I do think this book relies a little bit too much on the readers having a general knowledge of recent Sonic games. Ian does his due diligence with introducing the Deadly Six before they properly make their grand appearance, but this still feels a little rushed. Again, if we had a little bit more time expanding this universe, maybe had a story arc featuring the Six prior to the Metal Virus, this could have gone a long way. Then again, you can't leave Eggman out of the picture for too long, and you need to establish him as the big bad in a big way, and they kind of did do just that. Look, this particular criticism only works from the perspective of somebody brand new to all things Sonic, and even in that sense, they do a fairly good job telling you who these characters are, and if you're really that curious, you know where to go back and find more content featuring them. As it stands for what's been previously established, the Six not only work just fine, they're far more realized as characters than they ever have been before, and this story does make for a fantastic introduction to them if this is your first time with Zavik's crew. They are well-defined and a legitimate threat. Their vague abilities are fully utilized, and for the first time in my life, I'm actually interested to see what's next for them. That's something Sonic Lost World failed to do with the hours I gave that game. This was a great time for a lot of other characters to shine. This is where we first meet Cream and Gemeral in this comic, and their story, especially the battle with Xena, was absolutely incredible. Vector firmly establishes why he's a respected leader, as goofy as he can be, and even when he's finally taken out in the 
metal virus, he goes down in one of the most memorable scenes of the entire story. Tangle, as well, keeps a smile firmly planted on her face even as she's turned, and the visceral reaction of Whisper having to learn that yet again she's lost somebody she loved? It's incredibly powerful. And outside of the Deadly Six, I also need to give a shout out to how the rest of the villains were handled. Metal Sonic, who was technically the first major baddie to be taken down in IDW, had a lot of characterization for the brief moments we had him. And that's amazing to me. I found him far more interesting here than when he had a mouth and a super form. His struggles to compete and replicate the real Sonic and then being his savior in the last desperate moments of that final battle? I mean, they were just... Uh, that, that moment was glorious. People are frustrated with Shadow because we've watched him grow into something more than just a clone of Sonic. But Metal... That's his purpose. That's his design. That's who he will always be, whether he likes it or not. So seeing these fleeting moments with the bot have been very impactful. Starline, of course, being a villain new to the series, has immediately established himself as a far more engaging right-hand man than the likes of Snively ever was. And that's thanks to his very well-defined pompous attitude and his meddling that helped Eggman return to form. And it is Starline's particular MacGuffin that helped clean up this mess that he helped create. And as for Eggman himself, yes, I would have liked some more time with Mr. Tinker. And yes, I would have liked the saga to take place after a little more world building. But you gotta admit, the Doctor knows how to make an entrance. When IDW stopped teasing us with Neo's copy ability or Mr. Tinker, once the real deal stepped onto the field, he was quick to show the world that he was not messing around. And even if you never played Sonic Forces before, you can see how this dude managed to cause such a ruckus in such a short amount of time. Then again, Forces didn't really bother showing us that either. They kind of left out the most important chunk of that story, but whatever. And really, it was a risky move to spend this much time exploring this one idea. It got a little tedious waiting from month to month, especially when it was ironically delayed by a real-world pandemic. But I do think this really pay into the impact the Metal Virus had on this world. We could see the character's exhaustion and desperation. You got to feel the impact it had on these characters that we've come to know in some form or another for decades now. Seeing them torn down physically and emotionally, yet still continue to fight on, even when all hope feels lost? and made their victory at the end all the more rewarding. Things felt a little rushed with Super Sonic and Silver, and I really would have liked to explore why Sonic Speed had such an impact on the Metal Virus. I saw one commenter mentioning that it was probably Sonic's crazy metabolism that was helping keep things in check, again working just like a real virus, but a quick throwaway line would have been nice there. And also, I know us hardcore fans understand that the Master Emerald is a little loosey-goosey in terms of what it can do, but the IDW book itself confirms that it can charge Super Forms, and even if it's technically only robots, we need that explained. Because they all meet up on Angel Island, and for some reason, they're desperate to grab the rest of the Chaos Emeralds, when, if you've just read this book, you have to wonder why doesn't Sonic just rush over to the Master Emerald and use that to cure himself? And even then, this same book establishes that robots can go super. So what's to say that the Chaos Emeralds don't just fuel a zombotified Sonic? What if we just got a super zombot Sonic instead of him being cured? And again, this is one of those times where I know more hardcore fans are going to comment and say, well, Super Sonic can heal, blah, 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 blah. None of this is explained in the comic book. That is my problem here. You need to have all of this make sense within the established universe. And every now and then, this is requiring you to to go really deep into the Hedgehog's lore when the lore itself is wildly inconsistent. And I still can't quite wrap my head around the logic of clearing the world of the virus with the warp topaz and emerald power. Please don't Eggman explain it to me in the comments. I read the book. I know how it works. It just feels flimsy to me. I appreciate how desperate things were getting as they shot down every solution. But again, if you shoot down everything else, you better have a damn good solution at the end of all of this. And at the end, it was just chaos emeralds again. And ultimately, they're still very vague about how any of these gems actually work. I mean, that topaz could only make portals at first, but then they get very loosey-goosey on what the term warped actually means. And by the end of it, I wasn't really sure how it was actually all that different from the emeralds or the phantom ruby. It can open portals, or it can warp memory, or it can warp reality. Like, sort that out. You can't just drop that in out of nowhere to, I, whatever. 
This is a larger problem with Sonic's stories, and in terms of the warp topaz, they at least do a better job explaining some of the more specific abilities and power constraints. I just really would like this stuff a little further defined. Still, I'm not gonna lie, you heard me scream, I had a great time with that finale. Because it really isn't all that different from other Sonic game stories, and that stayed consistent through the entire run. This felt like an elaborate pitch for a Sonic game, not only laying out the general narrative, but also going so far as to explain mechanics. Everything from Sonic having to run to keep the virus in check, even potential stealth sections with tails, and letting heroes and villains shine in that final stretch for the fight for the emeralds. Having a lot of these characters interact for the very first time. All that would make for one hell of a story and video game leading up to that final rush of Sonic, Metal, and Silver against the giant Zavok. And then having the supers clear the world, and of course, Cherry on top being that brilliantly designed Omega Mech boss fight. Flynn has a lot more restrictions and a lot less to work with when compared to his time on Archie, which already had a lot of restrictions after Sega had to tighten things up after all that lawsuit drama. And even with these constraints, Flynn hits it out of the park. This is a zombie story done Sonic style, not just in terms of narrative, but making the reader desperate to live out this story with a controller in hand. Even in the modern boost era interpretations of these characters, watered down and vanilla, being something more akin to a Mario cast, even in this setting, compelling emotional stories can be had when given to the right writer. It shows, despite the many complaints fans have these days, why we still love these characters. And yes, you can have emotionally engaging, intense narratives that's still safe for kids. That doesn't sound like it's talking down to its entire readership. And it doesn't feel out of place in a world full of colorful cartoon animals. Now, how they can ever top that or keep things compelling? I don't know but I'm certainly sticking around to find out. This was Ian Flynn's last story as head writer of Sonic Comics. He's still around and he's still working on other Sonic projects, but staying on as the consistent head writer ended with the Metal Virus, and that was one hell of a high note to bow out on. Well done. But yeah, both good and bad, those are my thoughts. There were flaws, some fairly glaring ones, but some I felt the writer himself was very aware of and trying to address with the constraints he had. And at the end of the day, I loved what this story was, and I think it stands out as one of the most compelling narratives in the history of the Sonic franchise. And it does all this while making a brilliant pitch for a video game I would love to play. Taking in things I've known and wanted, while bringing in brand new ideas I could never even thought of. That's what a good Sonic game should do. But yeah, let me know what you thought in the comments down below. It's finally time for us to put the story to rest. Thank you all for sticking with me through this crazy ride, and thank you to the patrons who've been supporting me. Now what I cover next? Well, you'll just have to stick around and find out. But until next time, toot toot Sonic Warriors!